He's got a laptop. Keep your microphones on mute throughout the meeting, which prevent feedback as we've just experienced. If you're still getting feedback, please turn off nearby devices. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand or virtual hand at my attention. Um, and the chat function must not be used to have conversations with other participants or to provide information. All chat is recorded. Please only use the chat function to alert you to speak, to raise the platform, to record tech problems. It's a formal meeting of Hackney Council, so please note the press may be in um, attendance. The rights of the press and public to record and film the meeting will apply. So, um, so welcome everyone again. Um, so, I just to write a word apologies for absence. I've got apologies from Councillor Sharon Patrick and Councillor Ben Hayhurst. So Any other apologies for absence? No, thank you. Um, and welcome to Councillor Joseph, who's attending virtually. Um, item two is the urgent items um, of business. I haven't been notified of any urgent items. So item three is declarations of interest. Um, do members have any interest to declare? No, thank you very much. So I'll now proceed to agenda item four. I mean, I will say we've got quite a packed agenda this evening, so I'm going to be asking um, everyone who's uh, presenting or participating to be as succinct as possible and to try and keep to time if you're doing a presentation. Um, so for this um, item, um, this um, I'd like to um, welcome Bruce Duval, who will be answering questions. I think we're going to be taking the reporter's word up to on that in a minute. Just a quick introduction. Um, so. Um, this report is um, our annual report on complaints and inquiries. So in accordance with scrutiny panel's remit, remit to monitor the council's complaints and inquiries process. This is the annual report for 2021-2022. It provides analysis of the following complaints received, performance of services, progress of improvement work and quality assessment from the complaints, members' inquiries received in order to ensure it's learning from the service, the learning has been adequately shared. So I'd like to to welcome Bruce, the head of um, business intelligence and elections and member services. Um, we've all read the reports, so I think we're going to be proceeding um, directly to questions, if that's okay. And actually, we've got a couple of brief opening remarks. Um, yeah, I'm just going to start, and then I'll, I'll hand over to colleagues. Um, so, you acknowledge in 3.2 um, in the report that complaint members' inquiries have reached um, unprecedented levels. Um, you know, I was just wondering if this is putting um, additional stress on services and what measures are being put in place to reduce this volume. And I've got another question before we proceed to be um, around from colleagues. Do you see a distinction between members' inquiries and complaints and do you identify, how do you identify overlaps? Do you see learning from members' inquiries and do you have any information about response times? Um, and then thirdly, while I'm sort of holding the floor, um, I mean, obviously, it's really, really helpful to see the learning um, in response to complaints. But I mean, I suppose it does sometimes beg the question: um, Do residents have to complain in order to see an improvement in services? So maybe if you just any reflections on that, I'll let you answer those. That's three questions. Then I'll move on to colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we are um, sort of record levels of those. Um, Inquiries and sort of complaints and members' inquiries. If you take those those combined, um, I would say, as I think we pointed out in the report, the I think the members' inquiries figure is is in, is larger than normal, dri driven by around about half a dozen members that have produced about five six hundred. Um, Complaint or inquiries, if not more, between them. So, if we take that out of the, the equation, then that number is a bit more, uh, a bit more normal. Obviously, the complaints level is is a lot higher, um, but had been the previous two years have been on a downward, a downward trajectory, and and I think suppressed in the year before around COVID, where we'd seen um, case work with the mayor increase, um, where I think people went to the mayor rather than come through thinking the council had. It goes down when it when that, in fact it, it, it hadn't. Um, yes, that does cause is some stress on services in dealing with um, with those, um, but they are getting through through those and and responding to people. Um, and I think you can see through when we thought through all the way through to 
to the Ombudsman in terms of, of things. I think there's nine cases with the LGO and five cases with the um, Housing Ombudsman where in total out of all of those where they found fault that we had it. So out of how many thousands of cases when you combine everything together, there were sort of 14, 14 cases where the two Ombudsmen found, found fault but the council didn't find fault. Um, obviously everyone is doing their utmost to reduce that, that volume in everything in everything that they uh, in all those services do. In terms of the distinction between complaints and members' inquiries, yes, there is there is distinction. Um, complaints have a very defined process of two stages and then through to either the housing ombudsman or the um, or the local government and social care ombudsman. Um, members' inquiries don't have that that formal escalation process, though we will take them through and if needs be do a, a review and push them into that that um that process if it's appropriate to to do so and it's best for the resident as as well taking the resident's interest at heart um, we always look for overlap um because some residents and members at times will scatter down things that will come in over a number of um, processes so we'll do our best to find that down so we're only looking at things one so we're not repeat sort of looking at things more than um more than once um response times are in in the um in the report yes it has had an effect on on response times um they're up by i think sort of five to ten days depending upon sort of what what you're looking at so it has it has slowed things down that volume um but we are still we are still answering stuff in a in a reasonable a reasonable time period we'd always want to do that we're going to bring that down as we bring um the volume down then which is bring those um, response times down as well and my third rather rhetorical point was really about do residents have to make a complaint in order to get service improvement or other other ways of um, it's one it's one way i mean you should do for i mean what i would call the big the big ticket items should need a complaint but it's it's another form of where things don't go wrong it's often the earliest form of where things aren't working mm. um so if you get suddenly if something changes or something you suddenly get a run of complaints it's a really good indicator an early indicator of something going wrong in the service or something going wrong with the implementation of a, a change of policy or change of service so it's it's a good it can be a good indication of a barometer of things um sort of early indicator of things thanks very much i'll now open the floor to colleagues who wants to come in first <coughs> Captain Bennington and Captain Ajari. thanks very much Councillor gordon i'd just like to follow up immediately on that can you give me an example of when as a result of complaints a systemic problem has been resolved That's it. That's it. Yeah. I'm not wasting time. I'd like you to spend the time. Um, but, I mean, the report gives you lots of. Um... I saw the case studies. Yeah. But bearing in mind, we've got a kind of leaks and lifts problem with repairs, and a long-term problem with repairs. Um, it strikes me, having complained sometimes about the same kitchen having the same leak over a period of years that perhaps the complaints process and indeed the members inquiries process is not achieving the outcome we would seek in terms of improving the outcomes of our services i th i think it would be good or well, not truthfully to say that it's variable from service to service there's some services that are excellent on that and some that are still just dealing with the cases as they come rather than taking that step that step back and looking looking at things and taking that that sort of oh yeah it's, we're still not solving that but some of those things they know already it's not just the complaints coming they know already that things are wrong um so you can look at individual cases 
and yes, you can get repeat um, repeat on individual properties, um, but equally you can have the same thing go wrong in lots of different things. Well, well to be honest, Bruce, we're talking about both, aren't we? With leaks and lifts, we were in, we were remarking that the number of complaints apparently about leaks about lifts, we have individually made twenty one complaints about individual lifts across the um, across the borough. So that number twenty one might be the formal complaints. But will be multi multiple of those via members' inquiries, and yet nothing really seems to be done about that particular service. And then with the leaks, yes, I can talk about an individual kitchen, but really what I'm talking about is the fact that I've got multiple kitchens with multiple complaints about the same leaks, and I end up making them into complaints because the members' inquiry process does not give me satisfaction on behalf of my of my residents, and the, and the service is still not being improved. So if complaints is supposed to improve the service, I would suggest it's not doing that with something as pretty basic as repairs. And again, it goes back to the, the question, should we really be relying on the complaints process in order to be able to improve services? What is another form of improvement that we could see in, in, terms, of, in terms of outcomes for our residents when it comes to those services? So the last one, could you just clarify what you mean by Well, um, we've got some examples here of how complaints have improved the system. It goes back to Councillor Gordon's point. Should we be waiting? Should, should complaints be the process within which we improve services? I know I've actually had some informal conversations with officers which has improved services because of my own particular experience. I don't think service improvement should be driven by the 57 people who are elected. It should be driven by the experience of the tens of thousands of people who experience our, our, our services. And what processes do we have to improve those services before we get to members' inquiries and complaints? And I think, um, just if I can comment now, I think we're going to be picking up some of these same themes with the Chief Executive, mm. um, in addition to maybe sort of three parts of the groups and other, other members in. I was going to say, I'd be very happy to pick up some of those. Yeah. 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 Just sort of briefly, before that, then you've got a whole, a whole series of um, mm. sort of performance measures that they will have locally within the service, which would include lift breakdown times, which lifts are out of service, for example, um, repair times on leaks frequency etc um and on top of that there will be there are frequent um surveys of, of residents because you will pick stuff up in in that resident feedback as well um i take wholeheartedly what you're saying about those services i um and the issues there i i'm in, i'm in agreement um with with you but this is a obviously a, a broader thing across the whole across the whole authority mm -hmm. than just two elements of of one of one service, which is a service where there are there is lots of work sort of ongoing, and um, the street strategic central housing will be the, the best person there to update you on exactly what he's doing in those those services to improve to improve those. Thank you. Um, I think Councillor Ashley, do you want to come in? Councillor Conway, it was sort of in okay. relation to that. Yeah. Sorry, just very briefly, because on that point, this is not necessarily yeah. something, that might something that you'll be able to answer, Bruce, and might be best for Mark later on. I'm just thinking about, you know, like when we're doing major works on estates, are we put, are we piecing things together where we're able to say, well, actually, this block of flats, we've noticed that we've got 50 leaks in the past year in this block. And we've got major works planned for two years down the line. Could we bring that forward to save money because we're having to do this remedial work to fix? So are we able to piece, you know, how are we utilising the information that we have to improve services in that sort of way? I know that one of the things they do, they do look at, and it's one of the things where I, my team is, but I've got to stay sure look at cases before where there's things happening and they say, oh, but the response will get back from the house is, oh, we, there's work to plan. And the, the question then we've challenged before is, can we bring that forward? Can we do that work? And a couple of occasions we have worked, we've been able to bring works forward to, to actually resolve 
resolve problems. Um, sometimes it's needed things to be programmed in because there wasn't anything. So that's very true. They are things that we do do look at. Most certainly, I, I know within our team, if they get to stage stage two, that's something we do look at. Thank you, Councillor Ajayi. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think my, my question largely relates to the response times that have been outlined on the 17th report, alongside the investigation rates on page 16. I think something that I've often found amongst residents is that they will raise a complaint. Um, a case, the case is consi considered resolved. However, there are lots of ongoing actions that need to be taken in order to kind of bring that case to a conclusion. Often these cases don't, aren't escalated because the feeling within the respective services that has been dealt with, but the interim issues can exist for a number of years. And then there's no reflection of that in this report, because I know it's not individual cases that I've come across where that occurs. And that's been incredibly problematic for me in respect of not seeing that reflected here at all when i know it happens and i know by our own systems we consider them as having been dealt with so technically a case that was opened as a stage one officers as identified what they're going to do next will be closed off within a specific amount of time could be reflected here within the average of 32.1 days at the moment but i know that ultimately what's meant to have been dealt with hasn't been dealt with and there's ongoing dialogue and communication with residents which is affording them any sense of confidence in the system that they've accessed so it's not reflected here in any way i just want to find out whether that's something that has been looked at or not and if not whether moving forward that is something that can be analyzed um i don't know whether we whether we yeah. don't want to say but what i would say is that residents if they've had their stage one response will have um, information in every one of those responses how they can escalate to stage to stage two um, if they if they wish to stage two comes into my team rather than back into the service so it comes into an independent say an independent look so if at any time they can come and ask us to look at take a fresh look to get those things um you know, take just a fresh look at the at the case do you want to follow up to that quickly? Sorry. Then Councillor Jones is next. That may not necessarily be clear to residents because I know the dialogue that happens is largely between the residents and the service area itself. I doubt that there's ever any kind of return to the central form of complaint system because they've been assured that something is happening. Um, so they could have gone to stage two. You know, they've held off going to Ombudsman because of the fact that they've been told something's going to happen. But Timely action isn't taken. And I think that's, you know, when, when we say complaints being responded to, the expectation is that's been resolved in some way or another. And that's not necessarily what's happening. And I think it'd be good to kind of capture that. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, generally, we, um, the advice we give to, to people about closing stuff down is resolved before closed down. I mean, I know that's not always entirely possible on, on some housing repairs for example where there will be a program of of work that might go over three six months depending on stuff so you we wouldn't necessarily hold that that one open for the for the six for the six months but there would be an expectation that whoever was the place officer within the housing service that would do that would monitor that through to through to completion but in other areas they should, um banks should not be closed closed down until the issue is is resolved um that might not always be in agreement, depending upon on on the situation. But um, it should be that the things have been have been resolved, rather than just a response being written. Okay, thank you. I'll now bring in Councillor Joseph. He's been waiting patiently, and then Councillor Potter. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Bruce, for the report. Um, it was very interesting reading. Uh, I'm interested in. Um, your staffing levels, whether or not they've changed over the 10 years that we've got data for. Um, and in your opinion, do you need more staff? Is, is that the issue or is the issue the service areas themselves that are struggling? Interested in your, your views on that. Thank you. 
the staff, staffing levels, I, I couldn't um, give you a, an exact figure across services because it's it's disparate without out in each service as to how many people they've they've got working on that and those those structures in different areas have changed over time and the ways of dealing with things have, have changed as services have, have developed um, within my my team over 10 years I would say yes um, resources have re have reduced but I don't think at the stage to and dealing with the ombudsman that's been to any any detriment um, it, other things have have gone and um, uh, discussions about that but um, in terms of serving serving res residents at stage stage two in the ombudsman however we are taking a a fresh look at, at casework as we've indicated in, the, in there in the um, casework review so that will will have a, a fresh look across everything including how we how we deal with members inquiries particularly at the moment we have um, a one-size-fits-all approach which we know doesn't fit all and it needs a a differing approach depending what the situation is some of it is pure casework and needs to go down a more formal complaints type management process other things should be some really simple things that can just be answered or dealt with and dealt with another way other things are more complex and will need a site visit or a casework conference type thing to to resolve issues so we need that um that differing approach and that would be something um with councillor chapman we will be talking to you about in the in the coming weeks yeah. do we have a timeline for that um um, we will do once we we were literally been knocking talk, around for a while talk, talking outside around um, putting a date to formalise all that. So we're getting together hopefully at the start of next week to to put that together and come back to. You. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll be asking you that again. So thank you. Um, do you have a follow up, Councillor Joseph, or should I be just bringing Councillor Potter? No, please bring in Councillor Potter. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, would you have any comments on why the volume of mayoral and cabinet in, in inquiries has dropped? Um, do, is it the same total between the two, if you put the two together? And can you comment as well about how we compare with other boroughs? Do you kind of exchange information on the numbers of mem members' inquiries and, and complaints and the kind of compensation payouts that some of our like similar boroughs pay. Yeah. Um, yeah, similar, yeah, similar yeah. question to that. Sorry, just to add on. Um, it would be helpful I think, in, in future, if it's all possible, to also see the legal fees that are paid out. Um, because you, for some people, they would go through one route, but other people might have to access the legal route. And it would be quite helpful to see. So I think it gives a picture for us where things aren't working out. Region X is a different department. Um, legal fees, sorry. To so like settlements or, you know, where even the boss court for, for whatever reason um, and what that's resulted in to see if we are, so it's not because people not being satisfied or not getting the service they want isn't just reflected here, it's so reflected there. And I don't feel really as members that there's much an opportunity for us to have a great deal of oversight of what that is looking like, um, especially given the budget pressures that we're experiencing and we're seeing that it's compounded or so by um, exponential growth in legal fees being paid out um, in certain areas. I think it's something that would be really useful for us to have sides of. Um, but on that question about members inquiries, sorry, Ruth, you yeah. mentioned that I don't want to get you in trouble here, but you've mentioned that a few, that it's a few, a handful of councillors are generating a lot of um, casework. Does are people not using the system correctly? Because they're, if they're not, and if some of what's because it's either that the people who are generating lots, it's either that they're legitimate. Um, Cases, cases that are raising, and that, that raises the question as to why the rest of us, I'm assuming that I might not be in that box, so that, that handful, are not generating that degree of. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
and maybe it is just a thing or something to make sure that, you know, because we don't want to be using casework, you know, what is it? Unnecessarily. Yeah. So, so, I'll start. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of um, the mayor's going, the, mayor, the mayor's um, and cabinet case were sort of peaked for, for one for one year, and that was the best explanation we can come up with there. Is, is that was hit as COVID hit. So as COVID hit, the mayor's case went through the through the roof. Um, everybody sort of public what was seemed to come to the mayor for the things to ask things rather than coming to any other parts of the, the organisation, that and the that's falling back. <laughs> Back down again to more yeah. more normal more normal levels. Um, in terms of members, it it was a um, election a run up to an election, so you always it, so you, you always get an increase in um, casework every four years. But it's quite dramatic. Yeah, it's not but, but that's not as I say, that's not the, that's not the the total driver. That's a partial driver. But the the big chunk of that extra extra growth. Is the six or seven uh, members? If you take those out of the equation, you will come back down to a level that is um, what you've seen over over the previous the previous years. Um, I can see that a number of those are for one particular service. So there's been a, a lot of inquiries into the, and you can see that in some of the figures there into the benefit service. We've got six off the top head of six hundred and something versus ninety something figures are in the, the report in one in one year, and that's being driven by a small number of a small number of members. But there's also a couple of other members that have just been incredibly active compared with their colleagues in terms of the volume of of, of casework that they've they produce. I mean, you've got um, not obviously not going to name any any names, but you've got a, a real disparate level of activity across 57 members from not very much to incredibly high, incredibly high numbers. And that's one of the things allegedly officers and members to look at as part of the um, the casework. Review. So as Karen from Convoy was, was kind of alluding to, is it that, you know, everybody's raising casework, be it large or small, is raising correct casework in the sense, or are people using it ex excessively, the system excessively, would you suggest? Um, I, I think there's some excessive nature within, I mean, Ian might want to say more within the benefits um, benefit service, but some of that is an overhang of um, the backlogs of processing benefit claims um, for, as they recover now and start um, sort of processing the backlogs from the from the cyber attack. So there's mm -hmm. there are lots of things there where people are coming to houses asking asking questions about um, things that haven't been haven't been done. Okay, I think we're going to have to start um, drawing this to a, a conclusion um, shortly. Councillor Joseph, I saw your hand up, but has, has it gone down? Yes, it has. The, the question was answered, really. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, as the cabinet member responsible for members' inquiries, mm -hmm. um, just to add a few things that Bruce probably wouldn't say. Um, that someone raised the point about uh, training and understanding the system, and I think it is a fair comment that um, you know the, the training is provided, but not all members go. Um, and how I put it, that perhaps some of the members that don't go, I'm not blaming names or blaming, but uh, are the ones that could most benefit from it. So I think there is there is some um, you know point in uh, looking at how we do the training and trying to get more people to to engage with it, so they can you know we can use all use casework system more effectively. Um, I didn't respond directly to the timetable, but I will. I will assure you, I am urgently pursuing it. Um, I, I, I'm aware that there will be. I, I'm hoping to see some proposals at the end of the month, but um, I'm aware that there could be considerable discussions internally before we're able to, to sort of come back in terms of, particularly if the officers concerned want to recommend structural changes, and there's also uh, need to. You know, it needs to be common agreement across 
across across the, the, the organisation as to what we're doing. It's not something you can impose from, impose from the centre and expect to work. But um, I am regarding it as urgent. Mr. Gordon, um, can I just comment that yeah. Bruce probably because we were discussing quite a few items at the same time. You didn't comment on the comparison to other boroughs. Oh, sorry, that's not, um, in, in in terms of um, members' inquiries, I haven't got any um, any useful direct comparison. I have had comparisons from from other authorities, and it's um, almost as as spark as some of our. Um, um, sort of differences between our members raise case work here because every authority works slightly differently as to how they how they raise it. There's some we are very centralised compared with a lot of some authorities. Others people go to offices or they have to solve it themselves. Some have got no real support and they have to go and solve the problem um, the problem themselves and they have to go and find the people and. Try and deal with it. So I have, there isn't any useful um, sort of direct comparisons across London. The ones that we have had back from the authorities that I would say that we'd look closest to, we're not too we're not too dissimilar um, from from those in terms of um, in terms of volume of paper. How about payments to ombudsman? That's probably available. I don't know. Yeah, the fact the, the um, in terms of stuff from the from the ombudsman, um, in terms of session, we're not um, to we're not out there at all in terms of anything with ombudsman in terms of um, cases or in terms of um, payments or or anything. We are there. There's there's lots of authorities that are on watch this for uh, for ombudsman or have visits from ombudsman and have intervention from it. From them, we are we are not on any of those currently. Um, sort of listed with those with either the housing ombudsman or the uh, for government ombudsman. Although I think Councillor Conway's point about the absence of payment from legal settlements is is well made, and obviously the most serious cases would you know would go down that route and would be you know much more substantial payments. Obviously, depending on what the claim is about. So, but that would that would be outside of the claims. Yeah, no, I do appreciate that. Yeah. Just I think it's it is as as she said, it, it is. Yeah, I mean, the main, main thing yeah. for that potentially would be something like legal disrepair. Yeah. Um, um, but beyond that, it would be specialist type cases because yeah. for predominantly everything else would go through the through the um, complaints process generally because it would be it's a free free service for people rather than having to be a service that potentially could cost money to access the risk yeah um i mean thanks thanks very much for your report i mean it is um i mean i did it did, i mean i did find the information useful and also the um the case studies and i think um i mean obviously the times that we've had this report um front of panel there are obviously some service areas which feature very very heavily um we can see that there's you know slow response times multiple complaints and obviously you know you know, quite a lot of concern just dissatisfaction from residents who've been experiencing service failure and i think it would be good really to sort of tie up this sort of resolution of complaints to you know service improvements really mean broader so systemic service improvements rather than sort of um you know the um the really helpful case studies just one final question really um i think education and private sector housing have no previous years reporting um it is good to see that see them there actually i mean particularly um you know private sector housing is now a really really significant service which um affects a really large volume of our residents it is really good to see that sort of you know reflected in this um in this analysis um and i mean i suppose another thing really about complaints is that um some of our you know most vulnerable residents who maybe you know service families have the biggest impact and are probably the least equipped to complain again so though it's it's a really useful measure it does have its sort of limitations there were some reflections of each respond quickly and we'll have to probably move on on the agenda thank you yeah. oh just, sorry just back on that final point we do get a number of um complaints coming in from support organizations yeah. as well with advocates and everything else so that that support is accessible to people as well um thank you um well thanks very much um for 
you know, preparing the report um, and coming, coming along and responding um, to questions. I think we're now going to um, move on to um, agenda item five, which is the um, chief executive's question time. Um, so um, I'd like to welcome um, Mark Carroll, chief executive. Um, I think it's your it's your first chief executive's question time and also the first anniversary of your time. Um, the years today. Join jo 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 your So welcome and congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Well done surviving that. Yeah. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, each municipal year, this weekly panel um, holds question time with chief executive to ask about strategic direction of the council performance and decision making within the council. Um, following our formal invite for chief executive for this session, the panel outlined three topic areas in question. The focus of the session, the areas being covered tonight are in very broad terms if we have asked a little bit more detail, how the council is developing metrics and evaluating the outcomes for all council services and activities, how the council is restoring public confidence in the organisation and the methodology and ownership um, um, developing a whole system approach to anti-racism for um, Hackney, um, for the borough. So um, I'd like to, uh, Mark, understand that you're going to be um, giving us some of your reflections on your first year for um, about 10 minutes and then five minutes in each question. So you've got around 25 minutes. I'd really like you to stick to that time because it's obviously quite And I'll try and do less on reflections because yeah. 25 minutes talking at you sounds like an awful lot of time and not much time for questions. So I'll try and, I'll try and do that first bit, uh, uh, Sharp. Uh, and, and thank you. And thank you for both congratulating me on surviving. And uh, 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 honestly, this has been the best working year of my life. I've been so proud to be the chief here and have uh, loved it. I've said to everyone that it feels both like five minutes and 50 years at the same time. I can't quite remember life before Hackney, um, <laughs> but then you end up with a long list of all the things that you thought you were going to do on day one that uh, still feel like they're in front of you. Um, so I do want to give a few reflections, if that's all right, because I think it actually sets the context for, for much of what you asked me and what I wanted to then say, and actually some of the things that you were asking Bruce about. Um, so I, I went back to 2020 and watched the, um, the question time you did with Tim. Um, and that was inevitably quite a lot about COVID because, you know, right in the middle of it at the time and the, and the response of the council uh, to that. Um, uh, and Ian was with uh, Tim as he is uh, with me. And I think that's really important. So, you know, so, but one of the things that you asked, I think Councillor Hayhurst in particular asked, was about uh, legacy transform tra transition, stability of the council, what to change, all of that stuff. So I, I suppose I want to start by saying, you know, Tim was an extraordinary chief. He was here 14 years. He did an amazing job. He got the council from one place to another, entirely different place, um, supported brilliantly by a whole range of people. Um, which you know, Ian is is still very much uh, with us, part of the leadership team, played a key role in many of those years, um, and has continued to play a key role. So I haven't walked into a broken organisation. There are bits of it that we'll get into that are really not so great, but it's not a broken organisation. And I haven't come into an organisation as lots of chiefs do, which is to say my first act is to restructure my whole leadership team, bring in a whole load of new people that I've brought, that I've worked with in other places. That has not been my approach at all. It has been to, to very much take, take places here. So that kind of balance of having lots of stability, but recognising where we want to have a bit of change and where, and the, and where, where to focus on. So areas that I've really wanted to strengthen, that I, th I think that um, one of which has been about performance management and that all many of your questions, and we'll get into some of this when you ask those questions about metrics and I should say a bit more, but that sense about what drives our performance and how clear are we about where we will be in six months time and in a year's time on our performance, not just always looking backwards, your question about benchmarking, how we do in comparison to other people. You know, those things are really important. So strengthening performance management, um, uh, HR, uh, so human resources, um, organized, organizational development, policies, inclusion, um, anti-racism, diversity within the organization, all of which are you know, transactionally very good, have kept the council going in a, in a strong way, but are underpowered in an organization that has such a large workforce in such a diverse area. So, that, so the second thing I've really wanted to strengthen was HROD. 
Um, and then thirdly, we uh, wanted to give more leadership prominence to the work on climate uh, and climate change and the council's actions on it. It's such a big political priority. Um, uh, Council Wilson was part of the recruitment process for the new um, uh, group director uh, for climate homes and economy and bringing that together into what I hope will become a much more powerful thing. But it was really important that we had a, a really clear signal at the most senior level in the organ senior levels in the organization that this was this was integral to the approach. So those are the three things I did. Uh, we have, but I came into a leadership team that was already in transition because Helen had start Helen Woodland as um, group director responsible for adults and uh, public health had started in uh, March last year. Jackie as the DAS and uh, responsible for education started in August. I started in October. Ricardo started um, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and one of the things I did was. Um, was have a look at the leadership team and what kind of leadership corporate leadership team we wanted we used to call hackney management team i wanted to get that sense of leadership so we call it the hackney leadership team uh it, it is very focused on um, on the council um uh and uh, uh asked uh, dawn class mcdonald to join us that means that we are now i think the most diverse le corporate leadership team in the country um, and that's incredibly important because i think we probably have one of the most if not the most diverse cabinet in the country and one of the most diverse councils and that's really important when we get to these other conversations about who's at the top table and what's the what experience do they bring to those conversations about what we're doing um, so we have a different kind of conversation i suspect than previous leadership teams might have had certainly leadership teams in other councils would have just because of who's around the table and what what, what they bring and that's really been really important but it just means we've got that great mix of experience, people who've been around the organisation for a very long time, people who've come in with a very different set of eyes, having had some of that experience of working in different places. So that's really important. And the other bit to really, that I thought was really important was to really strengthen and rebuild that relationship with the wider leadership team, the kind of uh, directors, um, uh, strategic director group, and then the heads of service. I think almost inevitably, almost all organisations COVID had a very strange impact on all those kind of leadership meetings and groupings because something's happened hybrid. You've spent a lot of time with some people, but other people you never saw for two years. You know, so I think the remaking of all of that. Um, at my first corporate leadership team meeting, I said um, uh, with, sorry, with um, the cabinet, um, uh, having had lots of conversations, identified five priority areas. And these, I hope, will echo with the things you've asked me about. So first was about really being present and having visible pride and leadership in the organization, both with residents, with members, but with staff. You know, we've had staff who'd come in every day through COVID and other people who hadn't been in the building once. And I think that that sense that, you know, the senior leadership is present and it's here and it's proud of what we do and it's proud of all the things that we do is incredibly important. So that first, firstly, visible pride and passion about the, about the council and about Hackney as a place Secondly, kind of continuing the journey about inclusive and open organisation, that commitment to anti-racism and equality and diversity, and that that will be some of the things that people see us as a leadership team, uh, he and I, our colleagues, doing and doing um, uh, and, and focusing on. Thirdly, your conversations about metrics, you know, being really focused on um, on ambitious outcomes, not just on services, but it is important to focus, I'll come to the service second, but really having a real clear sense about the ambitious outcomes and having a sense about how we're doing against those. The danger for an organisation like us is we can become so focused on individual service services that actually we're not changing people's lives at all. All we're doing is providing such services and I think you know, I think some of you were involved in my interview process in different ways. You know, that question about, you know, is the council just a service provider or is it a platform for enabling change in for residents, for our communities? And I think it's clearly that. Three services that I thought needed really, we needed to really get a, a grip of. Um, Helen and Jackie were already telling me, children and adults both did in different ways. We'd had the unexpected Ofsted outcome a, a year and a bit earlier um that had really crystallized people's minds about what we need to do on children's um adults i think helen coming in felt it felt quite old-fashioned in comparison to other places that she'd been there were that we weren't take, um, responding to residents quite the same way and then housing just because it you know and housing repairs just jumped out at me 
did need to do very much to to understand that was going to be a big priority. And then lastly, the kind of um, and Ian's been um, leading this work with um, Emma McGowan on um, on starting to develop what a really modern creative council looks like. What how does it act? So what's a modern creative council? So those those were the five things I said. Um, it was good that they stack up pretty much. You get some of your questions um, and themes. Um, since then, of course, we've had cost of living, which is kind of cut. You know, I wasn't having a conversation about cost of living when I walked in through the door. You know, we talked about inequality, we talked about poverty, we talked about positive reduction framework. But this is something that's going to bite a much wider group of people than than our poorest and our most vulnerable. And it's really important that we've understood that. So again, we've been doing work, Ian and I, on um, focusing on residents, on businesses, on our own staff. You know, we will have staff who are absolutely affected by this, quite large numbers of staff who are caught still living. And then lastly, what the impact is going to be on our services. And, you know, the last weekend has told us that the government is not about to be very kind to local government. So that focus again on what does this actually, what's the cost of living and the government responses. So I suppose, so my, my reflections on that first year is, um, uh, and we'll get into the detail of it as you ask me questions and I'll go into those themes, if that's all right, Councillor Gordon. But I think it's um, that they feel like the right things to have done. We'll start to talk about progress and in each of them I can say, here's some things that I think we've made some progress on, here's a whole load of things that we've got to do um, still. So, you know, it, it, isn't, it isn't a kind of story of complacency, but it is a story in which things are, things are changing. Um, <laughs> um, and the last thing, and I say this, uh, I would say this if if others were here as well. You know, I think that the the senior leadership that we have in the organisation would walk into just about any other council in the country, and it's really important for me as the, the chief exec here, and therefore effectively the chair of the board, to really maximise that range of different talents and experiences, and make people feel valued, make people feel wanted, but really help them feel really connected. Um, uh, to, to the agenda and I think that that you know the council's biggest strength uh, people will always say will be its staff it's a platitude but it's really important here but in some services it's also some of our biggest challenges and so I probably stop on my theme on my kind of overview if that's all right and then just go into the theme would you like to go straight into the themes or do you want to well I just um are there any particular quick reflections on or questions on what Mark said of um yeah i mean um I, th I think it probably would be good if you just um go into the um go, go into the themes um yeah and then we'll um so can i, I mean maybe we can have some pauses if there are any sort of point yeah that points uh, come in, so. yeah okay well, well why don't i do why don't i do a theme and then if you're uh, they hang together as three but if you want if you want to interrupt me then do um uh if I do them in a slightly different order, can I do, I'll do restoring co public confidence first because it feels like it kind of frames everything else. Um, uh, and I went with Wal on Ward Walkabouts, I think with all of you, apart from, uh, yeah, I think I went with, oh, for Ward Walkabouts with all of you. Ricardo's been doing the same if he hasn't already got round. Um, what, what are the three things that you're told me? Housing repairs, I, I probably do housing repairs, housing repairs, housing repairs, but I won't. So first one, housing repairs. Second one, contacting the council and getting satisfactory outcomes. And you just had that conversation with Bruce. And then the third was impact of cyber on from particular services. You know, each, each council then told me something specific to their ward. Of course they did. But if you took a, what are the three things that ward councils I felt wanted to tell me that I should take away as big themes. Um, I've just seen the draft um, of the resident survey, so I, so it's not it's not yet finished. Um, but I thought I would just give you some reflections that come that come from that, and then pick up those those, those particular those particular things. So. Um, uh, overall, satisfaction has held up pretty well in the council. Um, and I think that is a real testament to uh, the leadership of the last three years. And much of that, uh, you know, before I arrived, which is why I think it is really important to recognise that. So overall satisfaction um, is at sixty-five percent. Um, LGA benchmarking data sixty-three percent, so above above London average, uh, and above sorry above national average. Uh, it's above London as well, but it's above, above national average. 
slight decline from la from last time survey was done was 2018 which was 68 percent so it's gone from 68 to 65 if you think during that period we've had both covid and the cyber attack here and nobody else had the cyber attack that's quite an extraordinary holding up i think um trust in count trust in the council is at 67 percent compared to the lga average of 48 so that's 48 place 67 um almost 20 percent higher here of those people who said they were dissatisfied and four percent said they were dissatisfied because of cyber and what i suspect is therefore cyber had a very very significant effect on very specific groups of people but not on everyone so for lots of people it wasn't a, it wasn't a dominant experience but for those people for whom it did matter it probably really mattered yes um uh, and 51% said we provide value for money, again, higher than the LGA average, which is 45%. Um, uh, we've got the LGA numbers just simply because the people that were using BMG actually do quite a lot of surveys and therefore were able to track against um, against some national, national numbers. Um, I think that if you'd said three years ago, you're going to go through COVID and you're going to go through cyber, uh, and that's what the numbers are going to look like, that would look pretty good. Um, however, uh, black and global majority residents, social renters, and those aged 55 and 60 to 64 frequently were the ones that, that were less satisfied. And that gives us that real kind of focus of what, where do we need to focus? So we do need to focus on continuing to get an upward trend and address it, but there are very, very specific groups for whom satisfaction is much lower. And it's not just lower on any individual question. It trends all of, all the way across the survey, as far as I can tell. You know, there might might be slight blips, but if you wanted a, a kind of high level story about what's happening, what's happening. So um, and and after LTNs, you won't be surprised. But most most things that people are dissatisfied with is LTNs. The second most uh, most significant thing that people complain about is being able to communicate with us. So. Um, uh, 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 so a reinforcement of that kind of contacting the council thing that you all played to me when I came around on ward visits being played out in the resident survey. Um, so some things that we're doing. Firstly, um, some work on on what does future work look like for the council, and we've been, you know, there, as I as I said, some, we basically had two groups of people during COVID. We had people who were in and people who were working from home and could choose to. We've developed a more sophisticated kind of version of that now to say there's six different personas, six different ways of thinking about how you, how you might work. Um, I have a much higher expectation that more people will be much more visible. And one of the things that Steve Waddington, uh, Ricardo and I have been really targeting has been supervisors and managers of people who've been in all the way through COVID, particularly people who work on our estates. Because I think that we've had the frontline staff in, but then but the people who manage them have been pretty invisible at times. They've been working from home, they might have felt very productive in their work from home, but actually residents haven't felt they've seen them, they, have, they haven't felt like they've had that kind of supervision. So I think so we're we're developing some work with pop through with Polly leading a work a group uh, across the council on on doing some of that. Secondly, we look we looked at um, customer service performance with with Rob Miller. Beginning of the year, so beginning of 22, um, uh, 50, we were answering 53% of all calls coming in. Uh, we're now at 67%. Um, uh, people get called back, so this is on direct. If you ring, do you get an answer? Not um, whether you get a call back, but whether you get redirected. Um, and in at the beginning of the year, again, average wait time was 33 minutes. It's now eight minutes for a call. So again, improvement, maybe not quite where we all want to be, but you know, eight minutes is certainly much better than 33. Um, on Bruce's point, he was being um, um, characteristically careful about what he said. As I understand complaints, uh, five members are responsible for 42% of all complaints. Now I may be wrong, and he will correct me if I am. Um, but it's of that, it's of that, what was the number I was given? So, so it, it's of that kind of magnitude. And I think that's important for two reasons. One is it's, it's, it's important in itself, but it's also really important that as you dig into information and data, you start getting a real story about what you want to be able to do as a consequence of it. 
because it's different to focus on a small number of members and say what's going on here why why are you doing that it than it is to say actually everyone's this is equally shared so you have so you have different sets of actions so it may not be quite so high it was a number i was given but let's go for that um yeah. on cyber i suspect you might want to go you might want to ask me lots of questions about this i won't go into lots of detail but just to say most services now back up and running and those aren't very clear plans in lots of detail and i'm sure you've had this in your various commissions um on by the end of the year um so I won't give you lots of lots of detail on that. The two things I did want to give a bit more on was neighbourhood offices, because you asked me about, um, and repairs. So on neighbourhood offices, um, uh, usage, uh, um, I'm told, you know, this predates me, but people very clear that usage of neighbourhood offices and people um, coming into them had really very significantly declined pre-pandemic. So even before even before the pandemic, this this question about whether they actually were performing a useful service had had, had been started to be raised. Um, new model approach and agreed in 21-22. I think on reflection, uh, not communicated that brilliantly, um, both with residents and with members. Probably, I'm looking at your faces as much as anything else to read them. But you know, I feel like there's something about. Do we communicate what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're going to do it in a really effective way? And I suspect not as well um, as we might have done. Um, there is a new surgery model. Um, um, have I suddenly got an echo? No, it's, it's taking my thoughts. Um, uh, okay. The mute button, four buttons in on the top row. If you've got a Mac. Oh, oh no, I don't know. It's not a Mac. Oh, if you do. Or in with from the left, but on the keypad. Top around. Um, Apologies. Yeah. Uh, no, that's all right. Yeah. So, new, new surgery model. Um, idea is to pilot it get up to 100 surgeries a month across uh, across wards um it need, it really needs to to be piloted so that we can really get feedback from ward councillors and tras and residents about whether it makes a difference or not whether it's working or not um otherwise um uh, and I, and you know i think ricardo and steve Waddington are absolutely clear that if it can resolve issues for te for tenants and residents, then it will be successful. And if it can't, and it's just a post box, um, then it won't. You know. So, and I think that was true about the the, the management offices in the in the past. Uh, so it has to lead to resolution. But I think there's an opportunity to co-design, and some of that will come into you know relevant commissions. And then on repairs. So since January, the mayor. Uh, two deputy mayors, cabinet member, myself, Steve Waddington, have all been meeting every month to look at the detail, really detailed set of data on um, on on where we are on our metrics. So since November, we've cleared November last year. So we've cleared seven thousand cases, which was in, all in the backlog. Um, current completion on time now is 80, running at eighty four percent. So jobs completed on time is 80, running at eighty four percent. Satisfaction with the work has improved from 57 to 67, 57% to 67%, um, so 10 percent improvement during the year. Now, 67% is not a number to particularly shout, uh, shout from rooftops about. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, it's also true, um, and when you were asked when you asked about benchmarking data, the RSLs generally are running at very similar run numbers right now. Most other boroughs that have got their own stock are running at very similar similarish numbers. So there is a real challenge about this across the sector. It's not just us, um, but I don't think sixty-seven percent. Nobody thinks sixty-seven percent is good enough. Our target is eighty. Um, eighty percent satisfaction. So what we know is there's a long way to go. Satisfaction, timeliness, and quality. So just that interaction. You know, do you turn up on time? Um, do you fix the stuff first of all? There's a focus on contract management, um, which I think, um, and and how we manage uh, uh, you know, our contracts on this. Um, a big issue around voids, and getting hold of void performance, um, which I'm afraid has gone in the wrong direction for too long. 
Um, uh, and so our average turnaround means that, you know, it just means it costs us lots of money. Uh, it means that there are residents who don't get properties. So, um, and then it's a difficult winter. I'm just going to very quickly on that. Sorry, I know I'm probably taking too much time. So, um, on, on just from the conversations you all had with Bruce on lifts, there is a big question about capital investment. You know, we're, we've got a number of lifts now that basically at the end of their working lives, and these questions that Ian is has been grappling with the team about. I know about how do we make the judgments about when it's worth repairing versus when we're actually just going to have to make a different decision about it. So there's that. There's a quite developed leaks and mould strategy. It may, it, may not, it may not feel like it yet, but that question about how we get hold of that. Um, and I think the utilising data to improve performance. So, so the, the, the chart that Bruce took you through on 23, 20, 22, 23, which is the kind of breakdown of, of in, in the complaints charts, actually has been really useful in my conversations with Ricardo about performance. So you can see that some of those areas, so if you take, um, if you take benefits, it's gone up by, the complaints about benefits has gone up 663% um, during this period. Um, and Bruce gave some reasons why, why that might be. I think central housing, you have to link up with housing repairs because I think it's just a different way of doing it, but they've gone up by about a third. Um, uh, but also waste and cleaning has gone up by 82%. You know, one of the real kind of prides of the council has gone up by 82%. So I think this question about using data rather than just collecting it is really important for us as a council, because I think that's, you know, and I think that will drive us. Do you want, do you want me to keep going? Shall I, um, I, be, I can be quick on the other two if you would like, or I can pause. Um, yeah, I mean, I, should we have a quick, round of questions um, and then go on to the other two questions because I think they are sort of very distinct or um, yeah I mean I've just got a couple of questions really <laughs> on sort of um, cyber attack um, I mean it's obviously good that resident satisfaction has been maintained at very you know high levels I mean however I think um, I mean the people have been impacted quite differently from the cyber attack I mean obviously there's quite a lot of individuals who've had um, you know, um, ca um, council tax issues, um, you know, sort of, um, and issues, you know, you know, very direct impacts. But there's also, I mean, there's been a hidden, hidden impact of it as well. I think, you know, less, this could be less prominent with many residents, you know, in terms of children's social care records and homelessness applications. So, I mean, I just, um, I think that, you know, I think really uh, the cyber attack, I think, has you know, had more of an impact than those satisfaction records um indicate and i think that's by jarring and Councillor conway sorry to the follow it is kind of um secondary question to councillor gordon's i just wanted to, if you were fair, able to further elaborate in the kind of demographic data in respect of the resident survey, because I was quite shocked myself to hear that was only 4% in respect of the same cyber attack who have kind of raised concerns about it. Mm. And to me, it suggests that those, the vulnerable groups with our, within our community are not necessarily engaged in this process because they're more likely to have been adversely affected and would have more likely than not have reflected that in responses to a process such as this. So is that something that, is our, our respondees reflective of our community as a whole? Uh, are you able to kind of advise on some of the elements of, in terms of breaking that down for us at all? Um, but yeah, I was quite surprised. Yeah. Okay. Then, then Councillor Conway, we just take through now. Um, yeah, well, I think it's somewhat um, related to that. I was, well, perhaps I shouldn't have been shocked to know that the breakdown, the demographic breakdown of the survey responses were different. And what came to mind for me is, are we in the surveys? benefiting from a change in demographic in the borough in that we've got a growing number of people who have less interaction with the council and the people who do have an interaction with the council are, remain unhappy and are probably still or even more unhappy than they were before and it just makes me think I've lived in this borough my whole life and I know that when I speak to you know I live in a council estate I've been in the same council half the time because all I ever hear is the council the council the council Look at this, the council. Look at this, the council. And then I've got other people who I come into contact with, more affluent parts of the borough, 
who speak really favourably about the fact that they can cycle to school with their children. Now, and I'm not going to say where I sit on this, but I can see it's a tale of two cities in terms of people's interpretations of the borough. So it just, it's less of a question perhaps, more goes down to the, the first question about what we're doing with the metrics, which I think runs through quite a lot of the stuff that we do on CYP and other commissions. Um, there's a lot that's hidden in that data that I think I think if I were to present that data to the residents who live in my block, they would scoff at that. Can, can I just add a slightly yeah. con contradictory, it's so, yeah. it's just a contradictory ob observation in a way in relation to this? Is my experience actually is that the in, the change in demographics doesn't necessarily mean that people are more satisfied because when they do have interactions and particularly in relation to cyber attacks, there's nothing like somebody with direct, with very very good Wi-Fi and broadband mm -hmm. to continue to um, chase. Likely, the process when their when their council tax has not worked or their planning application has been lost or their property searches are not are not being pursued. So, from particularly from my experience in my ward. I would say that the demographics aren't necessarily meaning that people feel happier about the, the no, council, but I, think, but, I think that, but I think they can be very, very angry <laughs> about things that, we, from our perspective as councillors, feel not as significant as the really complex needs and, um, and, uh, and um, expectations mm -hmm. of the, the older, uh, the, the more established Hackney residents. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I yeah. suppose I still feel that there are some, I think that if you are more, there are some people more dependent on the state. Yes, there are. And those are the people who have yeah. multiple contact yeah. with the local authority in a way in which yeah. people who are um, from different circumstances won't. Yeah. I don't have as much interaction with the council as others, despite the fact that I live in a in central housing. Yeah. So I feel, and I, so I suppose that's just my, I, I take your point. I've definitely dealt with casework along some of my as some type of residents yeah. yeah. talking about any but yeah, that's just my yeah. my worry there is that yeah. I know that okay. our demographics are changing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Mark, do you want to have a so, chance so, so, to yeah. respond to that? Uh, yeah. I just quickly just respond, respond to that and then yeah. come on to the others. Yeah. yeah. So um uh so on your point, I think um uh I'm absolutely saying that I think that there will that the, the impacts are probably being felt in on cyber in for particular groups of people, yeah. rather than for everyone. And I think, therefore, I'm not saying, oh, well, it's only four percent. We don't even really care about it. I'm absolutely not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that if you took the overall impact, that's where that's where it comes out. But its impact on different groups will be very different, and that's why I don't want to lose sight of. Black and global majority, social renters, people in that particular age group being dissatisfied across the piece. And that, you know, so don't hear from me if you did any level of complacency that, oh, well, it's all fine because it's at you know, 60 percent or whatever. It's, it's not that. Um, on, on the survey itself, um, we went to quite a lot of trouble to make sure that it had the right weightings in for different groupings. So both demographic grouping, so, you know, age spreads, um, uh, 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 on ethnicity, on religion, all of those kinds of spreads. Um, uh, so, so there was a lot of work done to make sure that it felt like it represented, including housing tenure. So it felt like it represented Hackney survey. Because there's no point having a survey that doesn't represent. You talk to a whole load of people that don't represent the bar, and you can't make any conclusions from that. So we have done that. What I'll say is when we're further on, I don't know whether we do it through this panel or we do it through your individual commissions, because I think there's quite you know, some really rich bits of work, but it's not yet finalised when it's when, when we've got final thing. We just think about with Polly, maybe with Polly Choi, you just think about what's the what's the way to have a, a more in-depth conversation about it. And I think um, that's that's something that um as panel we're you know we're very interested in. Um I think we've already got you know, plans to. Okay, so 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 that would be a good place to that would be a good place to uh, to to play that. Um, um, but uh, so I suppose I want to reassure you that we absolutely thought about weighted samples to make sure that we were capturing the diversity of of the borough in in the way that we ask questions. That does mean that there are different responses from different groups of people, and we need to pay attention to that. So if you're going out of this room, walking walking away and saying it wouldn't be. 
go away and say to the people that live on your estate, uh, Council Cornwall, um, oh, the council will say 67% of the people are satisfied because actually the number of social renters from black global majority who are satisfied will, be, will not be that number. It will be a different number. Um, uh, so, uh, and we'll work, work through that. Shall I pick up? Very I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I just wanted to um, follow up a little bit about the benchmarking because yeah. we, I think we, I, we've talked informally and I've certainly spoken to Ricardo about the, the, the nature of his directorate and the fact that it's got some yeah. really important um, standards of, sort of the hygiene of just being able to just do what you need to do. Have you managed it? Yeah, great. Um, which is yeah. keep the streets clean, um, collect your council tax properly, etc. Before you have the permission to do the really ambitious stuff that we talk about a lot, and that goes specifically to his to the climate change responsibility that he has. But I'm also aware, as chair of Skills Economy and Growth, the amount of the budget of the council that we scrutinise is small. The potential that it has for impact could be large but at the moment we literally don't know the impact of that money and what we get is we have spent x amount of money and i'm like so what so what what can you see is possible um to assess more effectively the impact of the investment that that the council makes particularly bearing in mind and this will inform the conversation we have in a moment in relation to the financial situation should we continue to spend that money when things are going to be so tight. Um, if, if I may actually, um, just, just as chair, I think your, um, I mean, the next theory was in your first question. So, I mean, I don't know whether you want to go on to that. So well, sure, I'll pick it up in, in what I'm going to say about metrics. Yeah. If that's what I was going to yeah. do, yeah. 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 I'll do the yeah. metrics next, if, if, yeah. if that's, yeah. yes, if that's yes, helpful yeah. to you. Um, um, so, so I think that um, in the way that you, you, you such, that's good, so I think you're absolutely right. I think there is, the straightforward um, data about service service performance or outcomes that should change every month that you have confidence in that changes um, um, and there is complex change where the things you do now you think are laying the foundations for a change that you want to see and so health inequalities would be a good example of that climate would be another example inclusive growth would be another example so if I do the simple first and then the more complicated. So on, on the simple, one of my observations, and I said it in my, my, my opening remarks, is um, that I think that we've always, the, the council, everything that I've seen has a really good rear view mirror. So it says where we've been, you know, and it often compares our performance to last year. So that's what we generally do. Last month we did X, this time last year we did Y. What that doesn't give us is where are we going to be in three months? Yeah. And if that's not where we want to be, what do we have to do to change that trajectory? So that's my first observation is that we don't really have some individual services do. So this is this is broad and sweeping. But as a as an overall, we don't have it. Where we do have it, it's finance. You know, we know absolutely on our money. Where if we carry on on this trajectory, this is what happens, and this is what we're going to need to do. And when uh, Rob and Ian take you, Councillor Chapman and Ian take you through that later on, you'll have absolutely that. But I suspect that when you have your conversations with your services, you don't get that very often. So, so the first thing is, even on data that is relatively simple, I, I want us to, to move into trajectories much more. The second is, if you use things like um, uh, um, uh, algae in form, there's fairly, and you know, DASs have it, um, uh, DCSs have it, there are fairly standard benchmarking tools now that enable you to compare your our performance against other boroughs, other statistical neighbours. You can just say, these are the groups of fact, these are the groups who we want to understand our performance relationship. Um, and we tended not to do that very much. Um, so, so those are the things that we are doing. It's starting to improve. The thing that um, you asked about resources in relation to complaints, the thing that we've massively under-resourced is that corporate sense of performance in the organisation. So Bruce has half a person managing the whole of our corporate performance in the organisation. Is that right? Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't move on this until Bruce had managed to 
get the election and then the by-election done because his leadership needed to focus on those things. So, so it does. This isn't. This is about change of culture and expectations. This isn't just about having lots of new people, but it does mean set, having some some of that work to set the time, the templates, to make sure that we've got the right data tools to be able to do that analysis. So people put in one bit of data, and it can be used lots of times. All of that stuff. So that should be relatively easy. I still think that you can still do some things with peer reviews and other things to kind of flesh that out. The more complicated, and it's always been, it is, a, it is much more complicated as these are much more complex outcomes where you've really got to set out your theory of change. And I think you've been frustrated that that setting out hasn't happened in your area at the speed that you would like it to. It is one of the things that um, uh, uh, Ricardo, I, Stephen Haynes have all had conversations about. What, where I think we are is that. Uh, uh, they will be ready to have conversations with you about two areas within the next couple of months if you want it on your commission specifically but this would be true for for other people as well but i think we're trying to develop it um, in those areas where we've got the, this real complexity so on employment skills out of learning being able to set up that, that that change journey and on, on area regen this is what we think change looks like and therefore this is what you'd measure in years one to two which is different to what you might measure in years three to four, which might be different to what you might do in five or six. Um, and if they, if, if, they pile, if they can pilot that and uh, get some ownership of that and get some understanding that that's the right approach, then I think there's a real commitment to doing that across our much more complex areas. But I think we've got to start somewhere and we've got to start with a couple of things that it feels like it, it, it's important to do. Um, uh, so I was talking to Stephen and uh, and Andrew, they're keen, I think, Tracy, to get onto the SEG um, commission in the uh, agenda in the next couple of months to be able to do some of that. And it might be worth doing some of that informally as well as formally. Um, there are, so, so that's where I am. I've spoken about housing. I won't, I won't talk about that. The only other thing I was going to say about metrics and performance is just pick up two bits because because the nature of the council and its ambitions there are two things we don't end up talking about a lot so firstly children's data so we've just had Ofsted looking at our MASH early help assessments um, and had a really positive set of um, comments back from them we'll get the, the, the actual report in October late October but it is a really they were both recognized our self-assessment they recognized the journey that we're on the things that we thought we were really strong on, they agreed with. The things that we thought were still in process, they agreed with that we're still in process. So that is a really important bit of how we're using data, and Jackie and her team and, uh, and others are using data to really drive performance. And then, um, and then on adults, um, you know, it's our biggest spend, you know, it's a huge, huge area where we've doubled the number of Care Act assessments that we do each month with the same resource. Um, we've reduced the backlog from 125 to 23 in assessments. That really does mean that people in real challenging circumstances now get their assessments so much earlier, so much faster, so much more responsive. And it, it, I just wanted to give it a bit of airtime because we end up not talking about those things very much in these conversations. We get drawn into, you know, the Ricardo's world of climate at home's economy a lot because that's where a lot of the political ambition is or we get drawn into uh, right you know that's right in the same way it's right to talk about inequalities and the, and uh and the forms in relation to that um it goes without saying and it links to what i would have said on about anti-racism that all of that data is only meaningful if you have real real uh, segregation and aggregation so you have a real understanding of whether all groups are having the same experience or different groups are having different so disaggregating it by by the things that are important to us is really important because we need to be able to tell, we need to be able to understand that and understand whether our impact is the same does that help? yeah that's very helpful thank you um so we've got our final question really yeah. on the whole systems approach to anti-racism. You could just give us the thoughts on that and then we'll have a final round of questions. Okay, Thank you. fine. Um, so so the, the thing I don't want to do is come in and say, oh, well, nothing was happening. And then I walked through the door. You know, this has been at least a five year journey in the council uh, um, uh, 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 of, of doing work. So it is really important that, you know, that we're, that we're building on it. But you did it, ask it in specifically in relation to the kind of reflections on child Q as well. Um, and my experience from lots of places. So I was the 
for those of you who don't know, um, I was the person in government who was tasked with leading the whole of government across the implementation of Stephen Lawrence's uh, inquiry. Um, and uh, what I would say about that is what I fear about Charles Q or I fear about George Floyd is the singular things that capture the imagination and capture interest and real intent have got to be grabbed hold of because you can make progress in a short space of time that you don't otherwise make progress on. But unless you've got real stamina and build things in for a really for the medium and long term, that disappears and the political climate moves away. It won't in Hackney, but you know, the partner agency commitment, all of those other things start to move away from you. So it's so you need both to be able to seize the moment, but also build in for, for, for the longer term. And that's that's generally my experience. Um, I spent quite a lot of time talking to uh, people in the organisation outside. It feels like those early years, there was quite a lot of, um, uh, and Councillor Conway and I had a bit of this conversation in relation to uh, people referral units and the work that you did on exclusion. Quite a lot of um, uh, focus on fixing what was wrong with the individuals or fixing what's wrong with the individual communities or community behaviours and a bit less on talking about institutional racism. Mm. And I think, you know, I think that uh, Child Q has given us that opportunity to properly do that. I think secondly, it's given us the opportunity to properly think about within black and global majority communities, there are lots of different experiences and to be able to understand those with greater granularity and understand where you, where you focus. Um, I, I won't tell you lots of things you know about council motions and the reports and stuff on that. I suppose I do want to say just because uh, I'm questioning you want to ask me questions um, on 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 child Q specifically. What did the council do um, uh, at officer level? I uh, I immediately started chairing a cross council meeting that involved all of my corporate leadership team and then the key bits of the rest of the council. We met every week. Uh, we were focused, uh, and remember that Child Q's recommendations are about us playing a supporting role to the system, not any directly related to us. So there's not a specific thing that we've got to do other than the, the exam question which you gave me, which is, are you going to lead system change across the system? Are you, are you going to be the organisation that does the, the joining up and keeping people honest in their, in their work? Um, so we focused on Child Q, Child Q's family, wider community, impact on staff, and then police and education as our, as our big themes. Um, and we carried all the way through um, from, from before the Child Q report, just before the Child Q report, through to the summer week, meeting weekly with a very detailed action plan. And Sonia Khan, I'm sure, has taken some of you through some of that in, in previous um, sessions, and I'm sure she'd very happily take you through through the detail of, of all of that. What I think it amounts to is, um, and the kind of, uh, and the, is six things that we're, we're really now focusing on. So firstly, holding the system to account. The most significant of those has been around education um, and the work that's happening within Hackney Education. And then secondly, uh, the Police Action Board, which I um, co-chair with the Borough Commander, um, and very focused work um, lots of work with communities on uh, on building uh, building that um secondly protective preventative positive action where 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 we should take it um and that i think has given new life to young black men outcomes report um, commission and a focus on driving that thirdly on tackling bias uh, um, and anti -discrimin and discrimination in our structures and processes some of which I've talked about in terms of internal processes, you know, that's why I want a post that really focuses on this. But secondly, on children education practice model. So again, hopefully some of that will be visible to you. Um, all of it done in a very hackneyish way of building that confidence with our communities and working really closely with communities. So that sense of communities being a part of the solution not and an asset rather than something that just gets the beneficiary of or somehow just gets the report dumped on it, but actually lots of that shaping. So one of the things is that many of the communities we were talking to didn't want to talk to the police for the first two months. They said, we want some space to be able to talk about these issues ourselves before we engage with police. You know, it's really important that we work with our communities and work with the police to understand why that was the right thing to do, rather than the police just saying, well, if they don't want to talk to us, we'll just do our own thing. 
Um, so I think, um, and they didn't. They were very responsive to that. But it, you know, it took it took it take the level of understanding. Then building into prosperity and well-being and the poverty reduction framework that, again, you all have seen has anti-racism at, at its heart, understanding experiences for different communities. And then lastly, that question about leadership and our workforce being reflective and why that is so important to us. Um, and we're then tracking progress through, you know, the whole series of individual actions. But I do think staff survey and resident survey will give us very clear tests of do 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 people believe that their experience will give them confidence that they will be discriminated against or won't be discriminated against, but they will be treated with, with the proper respect. And I think we've now got mechanisms through staff survey, which will be more frequent and resident survey to be able to get into that space to actually say, it's no use just doing a whole load of stuff if people don't think it makes the difference. Um, one last comment on, on, on systems leadership. One of the challenges for me this year has been um, feeling very new and then discovering that the borough commander goes halfway through the year um, and uh, Tracy Fletcher at the Homerton goes halfway through the year and we've got the um, integrated care um, systems being set up all around us. So the systems don't have a lot of stability at the moment, but when you look at the work that those things are doing, so you take the ICS place-based stuff, They've got our definition of anti-racism built into, and a commitment to delivery against that, built into the work that they're doing. So there's the kind of beginnings and framework of a system, but we, have, we are in um, still relatively um, new territory with some of those partners, I think. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we have gone over time Sorry. a bit. I think I, we can probably fit in two fairly succinct rounds of questions. I know people will have some. And I'm very, you know, yeah. people know that I'm very happy to have these conversations outside of here as well as formally through here. Nice. Conway, have we got a third one in the first round? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, relating back to metrics and your kind of revelation about Stephen Lawrence um, inquiry and how you implemented it across local governments. I think for me, Okay, in terms of, we've moved from Scarman to McPherson to the Child Q case. And I think, I mean, Sophie's probably lived the same experience I have within our borough in respect of the impact of racism. Um, so in terms of leading, and yeah, despite all of that work that has been done, racism has still existed in the systems and experiences that we've been faced with, irrespective of anything that happens even in a borough like Hackney, as diverse as it is and as welcome as we all are. Um, so I think for me, in terms of systems leadership, whether it's health, educational policing, and the metrics that we're so kind of keen on at the moment, how are we going to be able to measure that in terms of the work that's been undertaken in the authority? Because what I will say now, in, in terms of the work that Sophie, Councillor Conway has been doing with regard to exclusions, I'm very fearful of sending my child to secondary school in Hackney. And so it, that, that, it pains me to say that, but this is where I am at this stage. And I'd like to know that by the time she reaches there in four years or so, that these changes and the conversations that we have with our partners, partners do bring about the change that's needed. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, because like, Conway, do you want to? Yeah, my question is somewhat related. In all my experience on scrutiny, I feel my biggest challenge is about metrics, actually, and it's about the question for me is do we know what we're looking for because i often find that we're doing pieces of work and i knew that child q was going to happen child q was unfortunate but unsurprising because in the context of school exclusions disproportionality around that draconian behavior policies it was inevitable that something like that would happen and in fact it's probably happened already but this was the one much like george floyd that for whatever reason grab the attention of people. So my issue is that it shouldn't take us to be banging on the door in scrutiny to say, you see this thing here, this is, this is a problem. It's a problem for the people who are coming to us and telling us it's a problem. We're identifying it as a problem, um, rather than waiting for something to happen that grabs the public attention. So for me, in children's services, we've got a disproportionate number, a significantly disproportionate number of black children in the care system. We've got children who are and families who are entering 
um, who've been supported by children in social care who have mental health issues and yet we're our public health and our mental health response again you're seeing disproportionate disproportionately fewer black people accessing those services uh, it, we sit in scrutiny sometimes i'm wondering where is that oversight and also not just the oversight but the joint the joined up the how are we linking those things is children's services talking to health and saying, well, hold on a second, we've got a disproportionate number of black women whose children were taken into care because they've got poor mental health. Can we speak to health and find out what's going on there? So it's, do we know what we're looking for? Because I, I, that's the thing that I'm, I struggle with a bit because I'm confident that if, that we, if we have a commitment to capturing these metrics and following them, but I want to have the assurances that we even know what they are in the first place. Um. Sorry, do you want to take yeah. another? Do you want me to go back, or do you want to take more? No, no, no. Um, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so of course, I'm not going to say racism doesn't exist. You know, of course, it exists uh, and still exists, and it exists both on that individual level as well as on that institutional level. On some things, inevitably, there has been the the thing that we focus on is is changing. Um, so, uh, so when I was doing, so it, it, I was coordinating national government's uh, response rather than central local government's response. When I was doing that work, there was almost no conversation happening in 2000 about uh, black graduate empl employment. Because hmm. the conversation was all about how do you get uh, black young people, and particularly black men, into university. It wasn't about what happens when they come out of university. Now the conversation would be both of those things. It would be, we now see, that people are not going to be moving into graduate jobs in the way that you would expect them to. They're not going to the universities that you would expect them to. So the, so the, both the progress generates a different question. So I don't think the question's necessarily static to try and join those, those two things up. Um, and I think it is really important to be able to do that. I think it comes down to a, a kind of question which, um, I mean, you all have been in the organisation much longer than I have, about curiosity, really. It is, do people sit and just wait for something to come? Or are they curious about the, what is the experience? Are they talking to lots of people? So I was talking about benchmarking as a form of curiosity, really. This is happening, why is it happening? Mm. Why, why is our exclusion rate so much higher than everyone else's in London? What is happening about the number of black kids? What do we understand about that? So that level of curiosity is incredibly important. I feel confident that we are, we are becoming a leadership team that is more and more curious about what is happening, people in their individual services, as well as us as a corporate leadership team. But we're also coming out of time, you know, and I don't want to sound like a main organisation, but we're also coming out of time in which a, a quite small number of people have led the organisations through COVID and cyber are have been really focused on that and now we're asking them to focus on you know think differently and i think it's it's taking them on a journey of being able to do that and it's one of my leadership challenges to make sure we remain a really curious organization mm. the way that i was talking i, I answered um uh, councillor billington's question is i don't think i don't think we will have uh, that curiosity simply by sitting in a room by ourselves as a group of officers and knowing what the answer is so the people coming to you and having those conversations about what is that experience what should we be looking for are we looking at the right things does it feel right this is what we're focusing on is that right feels incredibly important to me uh, and you know again we you know a number of us around these tables have had informal conversations about being able to do that i think it is really important um uh and uh, and there are all sorts of questions that are hidden you know we haven't talked about the age community at all in this conversation there's a whole set of questions about and curiosity about what's happening in relation to that community and what we ought to be doing and how we ought to be working with them. So there's, you know, there's lots of different things that I think I would want to open up. Um, I don't feel like I've given you, I don't think I've given you a kind of definitive, it's going to be this, this and this. It's a, and, and it's more, a, we should have an attitude and a behaviour and, and a way of valuing that is consistent with that. I suppose my ask to you would be that our work around anti-racism, I'd like us to see that we're able to clearly identify what we think yeah. are um, where we feel there is evidence of, of potential um, systemic racism and bias within the system. What does that look like? 
and then to have a sense of where we want to be yeah. and what we're going to do yeah. to achieve it. And I feel that sometimes it's just not as clear cut as that what's being presented in terms of our approach to things. And I really feel that it, it, it can be yeah. simplified in that way. What, what, what does, what do these challenges look like and yeah. how do they present to the various different communities? Yeah. And I think on things, so you're, you're so, so I absolutely agree with that. And some of it will be that, that, that if you're then saying, if, if we're then saying we want to make progress, progress will be built on some foundations and you might not get the immediately the change but what you might get is we don't get the change unless we unless we do more of this unless we tackle some of those mental health issues that you're describing we won't get to some of the other changes we want to see in the number of kids coming into care or whatever that might be so i think it's really important to build that kind of theory of change and, and to have real ownership of it so i absolutely agree um uh, i don't know what what it doesn't feel to me that it feels to me that we've talked about other or probably make this my last comment and it's probably too provocative um, but it feels like we've got better at talking about some other organizations performance around race and not necessarily always talked about our own and the experience of uh, black people from our services not just talking about other people's services and so that that sort of thing we ought to do okay do we have any final questions from the panel i've got one i've got a question no okay um and i think yeah and thanks very much mark it's been a very um <laughs> i think um number of different things um coming together it's been you know i think it's been an you know, interesting sort of reflection it's obviously a work in progress um i think um yeah and i think it's it's obviously for the you know um position you know in terms of sort of you know um or continuity and change in terms of the sort of um the senior leadership teams obviously been um a number of different really quite significant challenges um from events and we're going to be hearing more about events when Ian comes on to his bit of the um presentation um I just really um you talked about curiosity and you know wanting to sort of stimulate curiosity across the the organization um I just really wanted to maybe think about whether we um you know having had all these events whether there's any sort of you know challenges from sort of exhaustion and whether we've got enough capacity across the organization really to sort of innovate and be sort of service leaders in terms of making change i know that's quite a big question but i just wonder whether you've got any quick reflections for that before we sort of close this item um i'm, I'm frightened I'll, I'll open up the next three three hours on on this um, I, I think that we're I think we're at a moment where some of the things will be uh, blindingly obvious that we ought to just do more of and understand more of. Um, if I was reading your face rights, then you know there are things that are blindingly obvious that we ought to just be better at and be better at tracking and understanding and be focused on. Um, and that's why I think you know benchmarking, understanding, or understanding our performance is really important. I think there's then um, there's then. Um, I know we were just talking about interracism and, and seriousness of that, but I just come back to um, to Bruce's Bruce's piece earlier on about if we really understand what's happening somewhere and really understand it with some granularity. So you know, large large number of cases. From, I won't repeat the numbers, but large number of cases from a very small number of councillors really helps us get to the heart of something in a way that just talking about large numbers of councillors mm -hmm. cases going on just doesn't mm -hmm. at all. So I think there's something about how we use data, how we use insight, and that's why I think if it links um, and I'll uh, uh, links to um, the work that Ian and uh, Emma are thinking about about what does what do we need to be a modern creative organisation that uses data well, that uses insight really well, that understands um, understands behaviour and understands insight in that way, you know. So so the kind of so I think it's being a, an organisation that has some of that much more built in to help people help colleagues it's also why i think the hrod point is very important so having you know a very clear sense of your organization development is really important um, i suspect that that might have opened up as many things as it closed down so i'm sorry about that but people know where i am if they want to follow up conversations um, and you know i'm always very happy to do that with people uh, you know Ian and i can join people for conversations thank you well, very much um yeah um, uh, and we'll see responding to our both pre-questions and questions for that meeting. Um, we're now going to move on to um, 
agenda item six, which is the um, quarterly finance update. Um, so this is a fixed budget scrutiny is a fixed item on the agenda of the scrutiny panel. Um, and I'd like to um, want to welcome um, Ian Williams and Jackie Moylan for their standard for presentation. Um, if you could try and please stick to maps for 10 minutes in making the presentation, then we'll get more questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Great stuff, and thanks for that, Chair. And good evening, everybody. Hope you're well. So, obviously, before the meeting, Chair, you asked, you sent to a number of areas for us to cover, and I think um, we'll hopefully cover those off. But I think what, what um, councillors on the call will also see from the presentation here, which um, sorry, I'm just well, welcome, Councillor Chapman. So, <laughs> <laughs> play afterwards as well. Is, there's an awful lot of detail in there that you can follow up with us on um, separately. Um, so, we'll hopefully cover everything you've asked, but also some of the um, issues that have been arising over the last week or so. So, you've had with the papers that came out uh, with the agenda the latest overall financial position and capital program report. So, I'll take it as read that you've had a chance to go through those and you'll understand the the in year position the council's facing in terms of financial pressures. I'll go on to give a quick overview of where we are in terms of um, positions across London that are emerging, a quick overview of the economic picture, and particularly how the, the current year's pay award is playing out. Um, a very quick update from the mini budget, what it means for Hackney. Um, some of us will be here on Thursday night for the pension committee meeting and just give you an update on that. I've given some of the coverage last week about concerns about pension funds, and I'll, I'll, I'll feel lay any concerns there. Thought it'd be helpful to give an update on where the council is in terms of energy costs and then talk about our approach to and to cost of living fees and charges and then i'll finish with a, a very quick update on where we are with the medium term financial plan and budget timeline of which i know we've got a further meeting on wednesday evening so general fund and hra forecast is as set out in the papers really we're forecasting an overspend of around eight million pounds for the general fund in the current year and i'm um, just shy of um, nine million pounds for the housing revenue account and we'll set out in the paperwork how we're going to look to address that but obviously it is a very challenging position probably one of the most challenging that certainly myself and the team have seen for many years and certainly Rob Councillor Chapman and I have been working very closely to make sure that where we can look to bring forward savings from future years or to, to drive out um, further efficiencies we're looking to do that to mitigate some of that overspend. It's interesting to see um, when you reflect on what um, all boroughs are forecasting in terms of the level of savings they're now anticipating needing to make over the period 22, 23 through to 25, 26. What we have seen is a significant increase in the savings that boroughs, um, through a recent survey that's been undertaken, are, are forecasting and the big drivers of that are demand growth and inflationary pressures that are coming downstream. Again, it would be a great surprise to, to anyone. Um, people will be seeing it in relation to their own household circumstances as well. Um, that increase is, is even more stark when you compare it to surveys that now that the Treasury Society has been undertaking for many years. And you can see that we are forecasting for the survey just concluded a substantial increase in um, the position in terms of the savings requirement that boroughs are forecasting for what I call the medium term position. And we're setting up a session between the Treasurers and the Chief Executives for early in November um, to sort of go through this in a bit more detail to understand what, what those pressures are. But you can see, you know, a lot of this is, is also driven by you know increasing contract costs and just those those inflationary payable pressures but no surprise to people energy costs also um are, are not a significant factor in in that breaking it down in a bit more granularity you can see the sort of key headings that are there in terms of where those numbers are coming from um, to give you a sense of, of the sort of issues what we are seeing is you know real um, pressures coming through across the board pay as well being a, not an insignificant uh, driver in some of that increase. Turning to the economic context and pay award, um, goes without saying that um, you know, the ongoing cost of living crisis and the likelihood of recession later this year is very much um, on the horizon. Um, the Bank of England has forecast um, potentially 13% inflation by the end of the year. I'm sure those forecasts will no doubt be um, constantly reviewed and updated. Um, and I, yeah, we've also seen the energy caps being introduced where it's an expectation they may reduce inflation in the short term but there's no real sign of any um, support beyond the end of March from, from what we can see. Again, we'll all be familiar with the counterinflationary measures that the Bank of England has brought forward in terms of interest rates and you know, all pundits are expecting further increases um, ahead. We've seen as a team sort of our public works loan board 
rates that we have access to um, increased not insignificantly in um, the last few weeks and some, some some significant increases have been identified there reflecting what's been going on in the wider markets and then we saw um, the relief from energy prices for households that the prime minister announced uh, when she took office um, similar support for, for business as well um, in Hackney, the 22-23 pay award is, is likely to have a significant financial impact on the council um, just for clarity for people whilst the headline that you've probably seen in a lot of the in sort of national uh, detail suggests an increase of £1,925 as a flat rate across all um, spinal column points because of the interaction with London living and um, London waiting. What we are seeing is an increase in inner London of 2,355 being the figure that's applied to all um, spinal column points. And for Hackney, what does that equate to? So when you include also any on costs that come with it, um, so things like pension contribution, national insurance contributions, you're seeing um, an estimated increase, an estimated cost of £11 million for the current year, around £2.2 million for housing revenue account. So that's saying that uncertainty um, for local funding remains with the impact of further whitehall efficiencies being announced over the last 12 hours from what people could, um, you know, you've seen what we've seen in, in the papers, figures of around £18 billion real terms cuts per annum um, were, were trailed in the media um, over the course of the day. Obviously, um, working with colleagues across um, across London, actually across the country, we're also engaging with officials at DLUC to try and get clarity about what that really means. Will that mean there'll be further um, look to councils to make further savings in terms of um, you know, anticipated funding that, that we'll be expecting? In a statement, Chancellor, as we all know, announced that package around um, tax cuts, clear signal around economic growth. We've seen um, reversal of the temporary one, um, temporary national insurance contribution increase um, muted from November and also um, cancellation of the planned health and social care levy. There was also announcements of extra money for councils around uh, adult social care discharge funding um, and also the abolition of the like, reduction of the basic rate of income tax 19% um, and there was an announcement to abolish the additional rate of um, income tax higher earnings at 45%, but obviously that was reversed more and more. Um, and then stamp duty exemptions, which you'll see. Uh, I think the energy price guarantee and the price offers that have been um, announced are ones I'm sure you're familiar with. Some other announcements that came through were things around planning an infrastructure bill aimed at accelerating delivery of vital infrastructure projects. An example would be the A13 London Safer Road Scheme um, and the announcement of new special investment zones and particularly um, looking to identify areas within the Great London Authority um, subregion to see what opportunities existed. However, there was no additional funding for the local government to um, co presentation new projects. Um, yeah, the economic impacts and announcements in the budget have been very stark in terms of the slide of sterling. And you know, we saw again how the Bank of England had to intervene, um, particularly yeah. to, to prop up um, real concerns that existed on, on pension funds. I've included in the fourth bullet point there just the scale of the movement we saw in the maturity rates and the PWL the loan rates and maturity rates. You see from the 1st of August we saw the rates at 1.58% um, rising to um, just over 5% on the 28th of September. That's an unprecedented increase in the cost of borrowing for local authorities in a very short period of time, probably um, one of the most significant we've ever seen in, in certainly in my, my time in the channel. <laughs> no comment. I said I'd just give you a quick update on the pension fund. It's probably worth just saying, and it would be useful for this committee as we covered it at pensions as well on Thursday. Past week, there's been a number of headlines about the impacts of recent financial market turmoil on pension funds and investments in government bonds. Um, safe to say that the problems there principally affected pension funds who hold a particular type of investment called leverage liability driven investments or LDIs. And these investments are quite common, particularly amongst funds in the private sector, where many funds are closed to new members and cannot tolerate much volatility in their investment. Um, the main issue is caused by the price of bonds dropping very rapidly in the week, um, and that requiring the cost of insuring against those risks going up significantly, meaning that pension funds have to find large sums of cash. And to do this, they have to sell government bonds, which may bond prices drop even further and risk spreading the issue to other parts of the market. Hence why the Bank of England stepped in. 
fact, the pension fund has not been affected by this issue. Like all local government schemes, it is open to new members and can afford to invest for a very long term and tolerate more volatility. I think that's just a summary of um, the position there, but I just thought it would be helpful given we're on public record at this meeting. I know, you know this committee previously has taken a big interest in pension fund matters, just the pension committee. Um, council's energy costs, as I'm sure um, councils on the panel know, the council purchased its energy using a framework managed mm -hmm. by LASER that were operated by Kent County Council. Um, this includes the council's energy in a basket where the energy is purchased and normally over a six month period, October to March, immediately before the contract year. And um, rationale around this type of purchasing is to balance historic trends that also energy costs are volatile, generally cheaper, the closer to the point of delivery, but the businesses do need certainty of costs for the budget year. From late 2021, also prices have reversed their usual trend and are now higher nearer the point of delivery. And in response, 23-24, the council authorised Laser to purchase energy early to try to take advantage of volatility and to seek to buy in the price dips. Currently, 70% of the gas and 50% of the electricity has already been purchased. Um, current council rates, I think this is what I just wanted to draw out for, for colleagues, really is that the current council rates are below the proposed cap rates from the 1st of October, and therefore little support can be expected in the current six month period we're in, in terms of the cost of energy for the council and you know, those parts of the local women family that in fact the buy into our contract. <clears throat> I've also set out, Chair, in response to your um, questions, a number of um, responses in terms of our overall response to cost of living. Um, they were quite detailed questions, so you will be asking a lot for me to cover them all in a few minutes, but if you, I'm happy to pause for questions here on the overall financial position and then go on to cost of yeah, living. Yeah, I mean, maybe we, if there is any questions there are any. on the overall financial position, um, or whether we feel that is covered quite a lot of things we might want to ask i think yeah yes yeah. certainly yeah um okay i think yeah maybe just okay. Okay. So, cost so cost of living yeah. and overall response mm -hmm. as mark set out really um this has been something which as corporate leadership team it's very clear to us this was going to become front and center mm -hmm. um not just core business but actually day-to-day -day business for the, for the organization and um, we've drafted our corporate response picking up on the four themes, residents, council staff and finances, businesses and the council and local institutions in terms of finances and delivery of, of services. And in particular, um, it's important that we understand what's happening in our own supply chains as well. We're reliant upon a number of people who provide services for us, be it home care providers, be it subcontractors in, in our supply chains and around some of the capital works we do. So we have to be live to any pressures that those organisations are also um, finding. So we've really beefed up our governance in this area, but we are continuing to do so. Uh, as Mark outlined, I'm the SRO in terms of our response and currently leading the council-wide work to make sure our plans are robust and, and in place to take us through it. Um, support and partnerships, um, the council already has, as you will know, that poverty framework, prioritising prevention, early years and early help, um, tackling low wages and and cost of living, but also responding to the material needs of poverty, key aspects of work underway, build upon the learning from the pandemic, and particularly some of those reports that went to, to audit committee. I think some of you who have been on the audit committee will recall a paper of the council, that their former councillor Sharman asked to be prepared to capture the lessons that have been learned. But we're really keen to make sure that we, we learn from that, um, simplifying access and developing support for people to maximise their income. And there's some really exciting work going on in this space building on our existing community partnerships and equi equipping frontline staff across the whole system to make sure they can help residents really access the support they, they have available and avoiding just simply sign posting and cold referrals. <clears throat> to support this, um, we've secured additional funding through the integrated care system and we've already looked to increase funding for advice support and the extension of the household support fund has now been confirmed um, a day before it was due to go live. We got the final figures confirmed in uh, on Friday, wasn't it, Jackie? Um, cost of living support, identifying need and impact. Council and partners are four main ways to, to identify need and direct and indirect impact, national data sets, um, local community insight, frontline service insight, and service data sets, so council data feeds into policy and practice uh, teams lift dash. And we've looked at work to synthesize this to inform understanding of groups in poverty for the poverty reduction framework. And we're now in the process of considering how we will prioritize those most at risk against the level of resilience and guided by the, the chart that's here. 
who is impacted and in need. Um, obviously, there'll be no surprises to members of this panel to the sorts of things that are being identified. Child poverty, as we know, 48% of children in poverty after housing costs. Um, working age adults, and you know, again, some of the mood music coming out of governments around further reductions in welfare make you suspect that that group particularly could find um, themselves struggling even more. Other groups, um, you know, older residents, tenants in the private rented and socially rented sectors, and um, and those also with that, um, potentially in with, with no recourse to public funds. Um, trends to watch. We've got a significant number of out of work claim accounts, which is about 5.2%, um, which is higher than in the pre pandemic days. And also, significant numbers of self employed um, are at the highest level it's ever been in Hackney. And that might well indicate people on relatively insecure incomes. And we saw some of that, didn't we, in the pandemic and the types of um, support that was available to people, particularly those who weren't able to access furlough or have particular um, business structures in, in place. Um, identifying need and impact, council and partners are four main ways to identify need and impact. National data sets, local community insight, frontline service insight across the system. Um, <coughs> data sets about volume and nature of need, um, and say council data feeds into policy and practice of the dashboard. Um, more details of financial support from the council. Um, again, I'm sure none of this will be a great surprise to uh, to the panel here, discretionary housing payments, of which we're making great progress um, um, fencing that money, the discretionary crisis scheme and the fuel rebates. And it's pretty fair to say now that we've, we've actually paid out more money than we were given by government in relation to the £150 um, per household or per, per account. And we're just in the process of doing some final reconciliations on that. And of course, as we said previously, we are updating regularly in the overall financial position. Um, our position in relation to all of this. Um, always encouraged, it's a riveting read, as it's always been. Um, household Support Fund. Through the continuation of the Household Support Fund, um, we've alloc been allocated £2.8 million pounds for the period through to, well, the period from April 22 to September 22, and the scheme is now being extended until the 31st of March. And this extension, once formally approved, um, we're going to look to make sure that the provision is under uh, the key headings of children and families, not 19 pensioners, and help with housing costs and bills for people at risk of homelessness or becoming homeless. And the direction of our travel between now and March is going to be to keep um, focused on those groups, but to work with a wider age range of older people and a wider range of residents in, in support of accommodation. To target support through frontline early health, health and social care services. Um, information for residents, uh, sharing information on the support available to our residents is, is ultimately really important and needs to be mindful that the picture can be complex and difficult to navigate. We've created a book for you, people will see um, the Help at Hand guide that's been published on the internet and is available in hard copy form. It brings together in one place details of how residents can access advice and support from a range of sources for different issues, from um, support in relation to energy costs, debt advice and food costs. We know, that all, we know that not all residents have access online, and so um, we use the data we hold to proactively contact residents we know are in need. We're working with trusted services, community providers, and trusted community voices like the champions developed during the pandemic to convey key messages about support. And this is why we are focused on partnership work and, and frontline workers and support. Council approach to debt in the cost of living crisis already, and again, the panel be aware of the work we did to implement our one approach to corporate debt. Um, in terms of council tax and business rates, we are again issuing notices to residents that staff are clearly instructed to work with residents where they require assistance to develop affordable repayment plans. Crucially, we've empowered staff to extend arrangements over a longer period of time than we would necessarily have done and are dealing with residents and businesses based on their own circumstances and not setting a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, inserts are also included in all of our um, bills going out to residents encouraging people to contact us before they get into real difficulties and you know, I reiterate to yourselves and to your colleagues that where um, residents or businesses contact you saying they're struggling then it's really important they make contact with our teams because they want to help and um, they want to help people get into to sustainable um, payment plans. Where the recovery process may lead to summons, summons is being issued, um, our Stop the Knock team review all cases where residents are in receipt of um, 
redemption scheme and again attempt to help residents set up those affordable uh, repayment plans as part of all interactions with residents or businesses we encourage them to apply for any relief that they, they are eligible for to reduce that balance and also work with our money advisor network um, to help them manage their finances council approach to to debt at cost living crisis again with regards to housing rents financial inclusion team work closely with res with tenants who are falling into arrears and work with our rent collection team to help residents develop affordable uh, prepayment plans so you know again really working hard to make sure that where people do get into difficulties that supports there um, and eviction due to non-payment of rent is really a last resort and always considered on a case-by-case -case basis uh, Chair, you asked some questions around fees of charge, fees and charges. Are you happy for me to move on to that? Um, maybe that? just pause. Um, a quick pause. Are there any sort of questions, comments on the cost of living? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I will say, Ian, Jackie, it's um, an, it's an incredibly um, comprehensive and innovative um, program. I think it's you know it, it's very it's very impressive. Um, I mean, thank you. Um, you know, for that information, the um, you know, and the work that's been done. I mean, obviously, as you acknowledged in the presentation, there are challenges making sure that it reaches all the residents that that need it. And you know, there's complex information. This, you know, the, the, we need a you know advice service. You know, that's able to um, to support this. I mean, would be maybe my one question really is about sort of you know, a little bit more about the sort of you know, getting onto our sort of metrics and performance, and you know, I'm going to be evaluating it. And I can see that Councillor Joseph has got her hand up as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for that presentation. I mean, I can see that this looks great and there's an awful lot that we've got in place um, in theory for residents. But I would sort of say that accessing that support for some residents is is really still very, very difficult. And I mean, personally, I've had quite a lot of casework recently um, with private sector tenants whose housing benefit hasn't been paid for you know almost two years in some cases resulting in eviction um and they've been in contact with the council and they've you know it's not that they've not let us know they have and they've let councillors know and uh, we've been plugging away and we've actually advised them to go for things like uh, discretionary housing payment um only for the team to tell them that incorrectly that they're not eligible so um i'm very concerned actually about how how that's working what the criteria is um what the transparency is around the criteria for things such as discretionary housing payment uh, as a council i'd really appreciate kind of knowing a bit more about that and how how it's evaluated um i know that Obviously, the housing team has, has got a bit of a lessons learnt um, system in place. I wondered if that's extended to the uh, the DA, DHB team in particular, because um, it's it's something I am quite concerned about. People accessing it when they're entitled to. So, any comments on that? Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Chatwood. Yeah. Can I just come back first on that? Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Joseph, for your question. Um, the teams you know, dealing with benefits and uh, the, the revenues are, are under incredible pressure and doing an immense amount of work, as Ian just, Ian Williams just set out in his report there. Um, I, I, my experience is that uh, the service conducts itself as Ian has set out, and I don't know cases, you know, many cases where there have been unfair or improper. Uh, uh, treatment of our residents like that. Uh, obviously if you've got particular cases do raise them immediately and we'll follow through to see what happened but um, uh, that is not the way we behave and that's not what we experience. Yeah, yeah so um, absolutely that was Chapman's comments. I think on to, um, discretionary housing payments what we have looked to do um, extensively with um, councillors both new members and ones who've been on the council longer is is run extensive uh, training sessions i'm sure a number of people here have been to the sessions that um the housing needs team particularly on housing benefits to to enable um members to properly understand how to access and um, how to enable residents to know how to access all of those um different funds and i'm very happy to hold a further session if that would be helpful given we're in the midst of a, that cost of living crisis to make sure it's very clear and what we always make sure we are looking to do is where we have that discrete allocation of DHP, we love to make sure that we spend it fully in the calendar year, which it's um, allocated to us by government. Um, thanks, Ian. I had a broader question about metrics, but I could see that Councillor Joseph's 
has also got a follow-up. Um, so maybe if Councillor Joseph just asked a question, then you can respond to both at once. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I mean, with respect, we've got, I mean, this report shows that we've got 5,000 outstanding cases of underpayment or overpayment of housing benefit. Um, and obviously, clearly, people are impacted. I mean, we as a council are encouraging people into the private rented sector, and uh, they need to know that their housing benefits going to be paid because, it, I mean, essentially, if they're evicted, we're then responsible for these families. And we're, you know, rather than paying out a small amount in discretionary housing payment, we're then having to find emergency accommodation for them. So what would have been ultimately a small payment then becomes a significantly larger one. So I think in, in terms of our budget, it's really important to make sure that, you know, people that are entitled to this help are getting it. And in my experience, it's been quite difficult for my residents to access it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. In terms of metrics, we've um, looked to very clearly identify some, some key metrics and obviously it's still relatively its early stages. Um, but what we are doing as a team is looking to make sure firstly we've, we've got the data sources that we can, can draw upon, but also looking to, in, to enhance them as well. And just as an example, um, some fairly recent ones from on the staff side that we've got to explore is are we seeing um, you know, increasing numbers of staff decide to withdraw from being members of the pension scheme or go 50-50, which would be a, an indication of you know, um, financial stress in, in that space. I and mean, in addition to that, there's you know, a whole range of other indicators that we're looking at across the board. So the council tax team have started to look closely at people who traditionally have never got into difficulty with council tax payments, but, that's, but then slip into arrears, either direct debits, bounds, and, and are looking to make sure we've got some of those early warnings and flags to, to know where people who wouldn't normally be affected are getting into difficulty. I think the other fundamental issue about this cost of living crisis is it's going to affect a very wide range of people, probably some people who've never really been in that space in terms of um, you know, what, what we've, what's happened previously. It's been a very different time and it'll, it'll affect people in the private rented sector, people in our social stock um, and homeowners and shared ownership as well. Um, you know, some of the movements on you know, mortgage rates on, on private rented um, rents are, are just eye-watering in terms of, uh, before you get on to the general day-to-day -day cost of living pressures. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you've got any further comments on um, Councillor Joseph's second question or whether it's um, been covered. Follow up question. Well, I think, you know, yeah, there's always, I mean, take into account housing benefits, we've got the biggest housing benefit caseload in London. Mm. Obviously, the cyber attack was um, absolutely brutal in its impact. Um, what the team have been lucky to do is really work through all the cases as quickly as they can be. Um, so you all know from some of the cases I'm sure you've dealt with um, that have been raised, they are not straightforward, and particularly where um, there are complex situations that can take time and you know, they've made, there will be mistakes made. I'm not convinced that um, we've seen, you know, where, where there has been a risk of eviction, we've always looked to be able to intervene. And I've, you know, there may be there may have been some cases, but I've thought they're very minimal. They're not certainly the numbers quoted in the paper in terms of that people at risk of eviction. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much. So if we just have the, the final part of your presentation, then we'll have to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, fees and charges. Um, yeah. you'll be familiar with the scrutiny established task and finish group of fees and charges and the principles that were established, and in particular the inclusion of public sector calls to duty. Um, at the time, cost of living crisis, you know, we, we'd always built in that inflationary assumption, but that's not going to be straightforward, is it, going forwards? Um, what we are looking to do is for each fee and charge where there's um, potential to materially increase um, those charges, we're really looking to test the elasticity of demand, to test the um, you know, ability, of, ability to pay of, of users and see how it impacts on the market, because particularly in the space of things like commercial waste, where we work really hard to build a, a real viable offer, what we would want to do is see um, the market be, be cut from underneath us. So we're looking at all of those you know, significant fees and charges closely and work closely with Council Chapman and all Cabinet members and, and Chief Officers. Um, medium term financial plan updates, um, no real surprises here, I'm sure. Um, we're looking at a gap of around £25 million pounds for um, financial year 23 24 um, and there's a spread of um, ranges in that space as you won't be surprised to hear and um, we've still got significant uncertainties around government funding and significant uncertainties around the pressures coming forwards but you know there's a, a range of uh, forecasts there and nothing to meet the gap for 23 24 um, 
there's been extensive work over the last three three months to make sure that um, you know proposals are being developed. Um, there's a meeting on Wednesday evening of the scrutiny chairs and 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 to this panel and to go through the first wave of savings um, and also to to then see further work coming forward around income generation review that's been taking place um, and also to see how we can look at the opportunities for further efficiency targets that can be brought to bear. Um, housing revenue accounts, similarly, um, there's currently a consultation out at the moment around um, approaches to rent setting. Traditionally, it would have been simply CPI plus 1%, but the government has currently got a consultation out on, on potentially imposing a cap, albeit that comes with significant challenges around um, you know, the financial pressures that the HRA is, is under. Yeah. Uh, budget timeline, uh, no real surprises in terms of um, we've got to get the budget set by, by March. And you can see the sort of um, timeline there set out uh, quite graphically around the work that now needs to happen to make sure that is all in play by, by Council on the 1st of March. Um, in terms of scrutiny, as well as the regular updates of Audit Committee and the scrutiny of the past two years, we've had those regular catch ups with the Chairs of Scrutiny and Audit, and it's worked well to ensure that greater visibility and scrutiny of the financial position has been, um, been available. And there's a number of sessions planned. Um, 5th of October and 2nd of November are in. Diaries on, on hope. And I think I've just about managed to get there. Laura. Thanks, Sarah. So and have we got any final questions for Ian or Jackie and Don't be depressed. <laughs> <laughs> no. I was just going to comment on, you know, you obviously said it's uh, that you were going to balance the budget, but obviously there's still um on unforeseen challenges ahead really in terms of costings and yeah. you know this is a mammoth task i think it's probably as challenging as i've known it in what will be the 15th time of mm -hmm. signing for the budget so i think you know, speak to colleagues across london this morning i mean it is an unprecedented time that we face ourselves in a room and none of us in the room must underestimate that challenge and um externally driven volatility doesn't really help does it so, mark <laughs> It's all right. Just um, uh, uh, one interesting comment. Uh, a, I'd go back to what I said earlier on. You wouldn't want any other team anywhere else in the country running this. You know, I think it's really important that in a time of real challenge, we've got a brilliant team doing it, led by Ian, um, and that is really important. I suppose the second is just in your role as scrutiny chairs, we are going to have to take some tough decisions. And understanding and helping new members understand this, this, this kind of the, the framework and the parameters of what we're going to have to do just is going to be really helpful. So, you know, anything that I think Ian, uh, Councillor Chapman, Jackie, the team can do to work alongside you to help do that, I think is really important. Because we will bring forward things inevitably that we don't want to do. But, we'd, but within the overall scheme of things, we're going to have to do some difficult things. Um, and so anything that you think you want beforehand, you know, anything to help create the climate for that, create the context, create greater understanding so that people, you know, I think it's really important the way that we work with you through this next period, I think it's, it's important. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chair. Uh, Mark. Yeah, Councillor Chair, just well, that's exactly what I was going to say, but it was just the, I mean, uh, the, the problem is, of course, we're still we're in our 10th year of austerity now. Um, and as uh, statements today and over the last... Uh, I, think, I think it's 12 days. Well, I think it's going to It's, um, you know, obviously the pressure will continue over the next few years. I mean, there's, been, there's a big gap in the national budget, which we can only be made good by um, cuts in public service expenditure. Yeah. But um, as has been said, we've got you know the best team, but it's going to be a difficult job for us as a group of members to mm -hmm. to, to go through and establish what our priority is going to be in in, the, in this budget and the next few years ahead. I regret to say. Yeah, but maybe the first um, couple of weeks is casino. We've got eight meetings on these over the next couple of months, and then two, two scrutiny sessions, I believe. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we're now going to move on and try and speed up a little bit, I think. Um, so, um, so agenda item seven. Um, so this is, um, you know, because people have had a chance to read, we're reviewing the current arrangements, the engagement and involvement of children and young people with the 
oversee and scrutiny function in Hackney as part of our ambition to further involve children and young people in local democracy. So um, there's a manifesto commitment from the administration for 22-26 to further promote youth participation in our democratic functions by like inviting young people to attend equal scrutiny commissions to make sure council decisions and services work for young people. Thank you very much. Um, so there's been a much, um, I think it's Martin who's written this, um, in improving engagement and involvement with children and young people in scrutiny. Sets out the country arrangements in which children and young people are engaged and involved in scrutiny. Local engagement structures for children and young people. Um, principles for extending scrutiny engagement to children and young um, people. And several suggested proposals to improve children and young people's engagement and scrutiny to put forward for members to discuss and agree. Um, so I think in particular, um, we are just really inviting any um, views on more well, the very helpful, I think, and, and a comprehensive report. Um, and also we want to agree and adopt the principles outlined in point 3.3 in the report um, on 126 to 127 on the agenda for all scrutiny commissions. Um, I mean, obviously there are some challenges with this in, in terms of budgets as well, but I just don't, don't know whether um, members have got any sort of additional comments on the proposals um in particular the um the principles so yeah, maybe it would just help really if i just sort of briefly went through the principles um as as i set them out here um so um the key set of um principles are that young people should be engaged and consulted in those settings which they naturally congregate to feel safe and communicate freely that consultation should be flexible to reflect the differing degrees of involvement and time commitments young people may have. Approaches to consultation should aim to further develop the knowledge, skills and understanding of young people. While social media is an important tool for initial engagement, young people prefer face-to-face -face methods of consultation, preferably through peer-to-peer -peer research. Um, young people should be compensated for their contribution to consultations in recognition of their time, expertise and insight um, and in parity with other adult consultees and that parents should be involved in CYP, parents and carers consultations so they continue to play an important role in shaping the views of young people remain significant influence over the way they engage with and utilise services. So just while well, throwing it open really if we've got any sort of comments or contributions to um to this report are we that's cool. I, I yeah. don't mind coming in because yeah. I, I feel like Councillor Gordon and I have been instrumental in yeah sort of putting this forward and it's because we've been really trying on children and young people scrutiny commission to strengthen the voice of young people on that commission which for, for most people it's really obvious why that would be the case because we're talking about stuff that relates to children and young people but actually from speaking to youth parliament it became really apparent that actually the voice that's really very much absent from a lot of our consultations is the youth voice mm -hmm. and i think we're a disproportionately young borough yeah. and that the decisions that we're making are going to impact young people mm -hmm. um this is this is we're talking about their futures so it it makes sense that their voices would be included you know one of the examples i think for us is a conversation around the ltns where we felt that actually young people's perspectives on LTNs were, were pretty much absent from discourse around the introduction of LTNs. So I, yeah, I'm in strong favour of us not just trying to identify maybe when, when young people can be involved, but just having a seat at the table. I mean, but trying to make that interim that they have a seat at the table, but I suppose thinking building on the work that we're doing in cyp about how we can make that work it's it's no use if you've got a seat at the table and people aren't taking it up or they're disengaged and not not involved um oh, sorry yeah you know, oh. yeah i mean it's kind of it's highlighted in this report it does take additional resources so even at the time that we start to formulate our work programs, it's about ensuring that their voices are reflected within them. That's kind of touched upon here, but it's the ways and means of being able to do that. Um, and it does, it does will involve um, wider outreach. Now I myself have made, made a commitment to go to our youth hubs and kind of discuss what we're doing 
and potentially what they would like to see incorporated into our work program the next municipal year. That's something I would undertake, but obviously not every chair of a commission can do something like that. I just am able to do it at this given time. So it's about identifying how we can do that as part and parcel of this process. Um, and it not just be the same kind of co-opties, you know, whether it's the kind of Young People's Parliament or, you know, some of other related organisations. It's about extending it further afield than that, you know, whether it's going into Proves and finding out what they would like to, us to kind of be working on. Um, it is, it's about the ones that, not normally the tried and tested routes, I think, which have to be incorporated into this kind of work and this kind of commitment as well. Um, so, yeah. That's kind of it's kind of there within that, but it's yeah, resourcing it, I think, is what's kind of an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Councillor Joseph. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I think this is a really important initiative. Um it is I mean, all, all issues affect young people, don't they? And it's true, we would ordinarily just think of often think of them in terms of children and young people, but I think things like housing um, have such an enormous effect on um, on young people and, and their lives. And something that um, Councillor Adajari and I have been trying to do on living in Hackney is um, just hear basically from more residents in general. So we've done some quite a lot of pre-recorded video testimonies. Mm -hmm. um, one sec done interviews with um, residents and that might be um, something we could explore doing with young people um, so that we could all hear their voices and opinions on a subject but they wouldn't necessarily have to um, be present or or even log in um, but we could still hear you know some some of their views and their experiences because for example um, you know if we interview someone that's got a housing problem very often they've got children and that's affecting them too so yeah I think um, I think this is a really great idea I thought all the ideas were great <laughs> thank you yeah, um, I'm also supportive, so yeah. I think I'll keep, I'll yeah. keep my comments brief, but widening it across all scrutiny fun functions yeah. and yeah. having a systematic look at how young people's views can be yeah. at the start yeah. of the work program sounds a really good way to go. Yeah, I mean, I've, in our discussions with the, um, with the Youth Parliament, I mean, they were very, very clear that they, um, and they're obviously only one group of young people that we're um, consulting with, they're very, very clear that they had, you know, wide ranging interests across all council services. I mean, particularly um, Councillor Joseph, um, in relation to housing, um, Councillor Ajara is one of the, you know, things they particularly highlighted, um, you know, and, um, climate, climate justice, employment, so I mean, across all the um, scrutiny commissions. Um, so I think, um, I've only got one comment, I actually didn't pick it up before. I think maybe we should be saying, we should, it should be parents and carers, I mean, I know it's, but it just is, um, so, and I think we're, I can sense in the room, I think there's support for adopting the recommendations. Is that, sure. is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think we, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, so we need to sort of take this piece of work forward um, and obviously look at the resourcing issues. And I think really it's, um, you know, as Councillor Conway says as well, um, you know, it's young people that are going to have to live with our decisions for the, you know, for, for the longest period of time. They should be, you know, front and centre um, and shaping them. And I really hope we can get that sufficient resourcing to make that, you know, you know meaningful um, and a priority. Thank you. So I think we've speeded up a little bit. So um, now going on to agenda item eight, minutes of previous meeting. Um, so those, um, so they're on page 133, 245 of the agenda. We've got any, we've got, any, we've got no matters arising. Do members agree the minutes? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, so agenda item nine, um, scrutiny work programme, which is sort of obviously set out. I mean, obviously we've had um, ongoing discussions about this, and I think particularly in relation to, as we've alluded to the chief executive in relation to, um, you know, um, consultation and engagement. I mean, I think um, poverty reduction and, you know, um, as and aspects, whole systems approach in relation to, to anti-racism. So, I mean, these are things that will be developed as the work programme and filed. Is there any other comments or questions about it? Yeah. No? Agenda item 10, any other business? Any other business? There's no any other business? I formally declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much.
Nein, ich gehe irgendwie 39. <lacht> 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 